Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. I can't remember the what. No, it was hot and sunny. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Just get that on top. No, she's going to play around this weekend. Call the meeting in order. I believe Vice Chair Carter, you have the honors tonight. Yes, I do, don't I? Join me in time of prayer. Father God, as we gather here tonight to do the business of Alamance County, we ask that your power and your presence be with us, that you lead God and direct our thoughts, our deeds, our actions, that they'll be acceptable in your sight, that you be with those who've joined with us, dear Lord, give us peace and comfort through the night. We ask, dear Lord, that you guide our words, that they'll be acceptable. Dear Lord, we ask that you bless these transactions as we complete them for the citizens of Alamance County tonight and keep us safe. And we ask all this, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Join me in the pledge. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States, States of America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'm informed that we only have one speaker uh, on the agenda and that we have three other speakers that will speak uh, at the end of the meeting because they're addressing matters that are not on the agenda. So three speakers will be later. Uh, but David Vaughn, I understand you are addressing things that are on the agenda. I don't know if it's on the agenda or not. <laughs> you can go ahead. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Um, don't want you to think anything bad about me since I'm sitting beside the sheriff. <laughs> 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 so I don't want off to get to a bad start. We thought you had and I'm not going to directly <laughs> ask you for any money. <laughs> I don't. I've just met a few of you just a few minutes ago, and I really enjoyed that. And of course, Pam, I've known her. I should, shouldn't say should I forever for a long time. <laughs> um, I actually talked at the school she went to school to, uh, at and uh, I was there for 31 years um, at Southern High School I was a teacher football coach baseball coach athletic director I did quite a few things while I was there during that time um, I met a lot of kids and there was a lot of issues and drugs during that time and the reason I'm here tonight I saw it firsthand and I understand there's some money for the potential of a diversion center in Alamance County. Uh, I don't know your feeling on, on the kids that are having problems, but I know some of your lawyers and you probably represented some before. It's a real addiction. It's not just, they just not gonna do the drugs because they wanna do them. They do it first, but then they come addicted to them. And they have problems. And I've been told by the sheriff that 75% of all crimes are drug related. It may be a drug offense. It may be something they had to steal to try to support their habit. But we need to do something for these kids. They, they need a place to go. It's a revolving door at the jailhouse. That's doing no good. In fact, if, if we had a diversion clinic and they could go to that look how much money we would save for them going to jail eating three meals a day and staying there 
I, I'm just saying that I think there's money there. I hear there's money there. And it's something I think that really needs to be thought about. I have a, a very um, special friend of mine has two children. One's in jail now. The other one just got out of jail. All of it drug related. And they're not bad kids. But they're bad kids when they're on drugs. And they're going to do bad things. So my plea to the commissioners is I'm not asking you personally for money, but I know it's going to cost money. But in the long run, I think it's going to cost less to help these kids and get them on the right track and find a job and be a, a, a citizen of this county that, that he should be or she should be. And, and that's what we're looking for. And if we could do that, I, I think Alamance County uh, could, could set the table for the rest of the state and showing how it should be done. Is that three minutes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. But anyway, uh, I appreciate it. Nice to meet y'all. And this day. directly links into our LME conversation that we'll have tonight. And we've had discussions about the Diversion Center uh, specifically with one of the LME providers uh, that may be uh, voted on tonight. So your topic is right on point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. County Manager and uh, Ms. Clerk, I understand that the other speakers are not relating to topics that are on for tonight's agenda. Therefore, we'll keep those over for later. All right. Our, um, are there any other commissioner responses? I just want to just stand tall with David. Um, everybody knows how I feel about drugs. I despise them. And if you're a drug dealer watching this, your days are numbered because of what you do to our people in this county. You destroy lives. You wreck families. You kill people. And um, we've got to, it's getting younger and younger, and we cannot go after this hard enough. Um, I, I, I'm not going to get on the box but I'm going to get on the box in August. And um, I just cannot thank you enough for being a citizen that wants to accept the fact that we have a serious, legitimate disease that has taken the lives of all ages. Um, and it's a very expensive problem. Um, and so we really, this, these commissioners, I want us to be right beside the sheriff. I don't want the sheriff to always be him by himself with his deputies and his detectives and his drug enforcement team. We need to be the foundation of going after this and standing by our law enforcement and letting everybody in this county know if you want to come here, bad choice that you're going to do drugs in this county. Thank you. I did a little of that. Okay, uh, next we ordinarily would approve the agenda, but uh, there's several matters that uh, need to be addressed, I understand, Mr. Carter? Yes, uh, number one, I can't count the conversations I've had with people this last month and a half or two months about ARP and the funding. And over and over and over again, I've been promised them we'd be discussing that tonight. Well, this is the only meeting we have in July, and we have a long list of business to deal with, so we're not going to be discussing ARP tonight. So just in case anybody thought I was trying to lie, I asked John to give me a second to say, <laughs> <laughs> we're moving it to August the 2nd, but we're not forgetting about ARP. It's an important issue, and we want to have time to give it the time it needs to be discussed and how we're going to use that money. Uh, the other issue is um, I have a correction to the minutes, and so does Pam. Um, in the minutes, it, I, I, made a, I made a comment in uh, our July, our June, I think it was June the 19th meeting, about the, um, about the audit. and. It was transcribed incorrectly. It looks like I said June 21st, excuse me. It looks like I said or in the uh, in the transcription, it looked like I had said the audit had been, I, I meant that the audit had been completed. I knew that it hadn't. It won't be completed until about September. Tori has the correct language in that, and she will amend those minutes for us. And then Pam has a similar request. I just mentioned it to her, um, my little speech about, what well, little, about the importance of fathers and family in our county. At the very last of it, it talks about you must know who your enemy is to ever face one. And um, it was spelled W-O-N, and it should be O-N-E. I'm not OCD, but <laughs> I'm just saying. I know minutes could, like, 
jumps off a cliff. They got to be right. So, Mr. Carter or Ms. Thompson, do you have a motion to amend these? Uh, oh, yeah, I guess I do. I have a motion to amend those. All right, Ms. Carter, you want to second that? Second it. Yes. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous in favor of the corrections. All right. Um, additionally, um, look how the County Commissioners Association has indicated to me they've um, looked at some of our procedures and so forth, and they uh, realized that we did not have a deputy clerk. Um, we have had various people apparently prior to my being on the board and uh, possibly yes. prior to Mr. Carter being on the board, take notes and so forth when, uh, uh, when Tori, you were out at one period of time. Uh, she had a child. <laughs> Don't understand her not being here taking minutes while she was <laughs> but anyway. And for occasions like that, uh, they pointed out to me that we need to have a deputy clerk. Uh, we really acknowledge and appreciate everything that, uh, that you have done. Uh, we're not taking anything away. We're just wanting to appoint a deputy clerk uh, in the event that you should have a sickness or an illness or, um, or vacation or whatever, <laughs> so that we do have somebody that's legitimate to step in your place. Um, and I wish to nominate or, or make a motion that we have Sherry Hook, who's our assistant county manager and head of human resources, uh, she's the human resources director, to be appointed as deputy clerk to the board. Second. I'll second that motion. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Sounds like nobody's opposed because nobody said, everybody said aye. <laughs> okay. Agenda. We have, um, agenda. there are two other items. Um, I received a number of telephone calls asking that two things be taken off the consent agenda. Uh, those are, and if you look down at your list, that would be under category six, under consent agenda, and it would be item C, the Burlington School Board compensation item, and it would be item um, B. B. Thank you. Item B, uh, the out-of-state travel. And I would uh, suggest at this point we remove those from the consent agenda and move them to the regular uh, meetings under uh, I category number seven. I'll make, I'll second that motion. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous, thank you. Now, do we have a motion as amended as to the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Good, thank you. And we've already approved the minutes. That would be item F under this category six as well. All right, let's take up um, the Alamance Burlington School System compensation matter next. But Dr. Benson was gonna be here one. So I can, I can address that in just a moment if you'd like, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. And I did telephone Dr. Uh, Benson. I did not reach him because I was, as you know, taking my wife down to do for the emergency appointment. but. Um, and left him a message, but I have not talked to him directly, so I don't know if he's... I believe he's joining us with... Uh, he's, on Zoom. Yeah. he's on Zoom. I think okay. he and Mr. Teeter may be on, yeah. on the Zoom call. Uh, just to say, commissioners, we received a uh, memo from Dr. Benson <clears throat> dated July 8th uh, requesting that the County Board of Commissioners consider adjusting the monthly stipend of the Board of Education. Their current monthly stipend is $100. The request from um, the... Uh, superintendent was to adjust that to $300 per month. That does take uh, action by the Board of Commissioners per the general statute. I believe we have uh, Dr. Benson here with us via Zoom. So Dr. Benson, I'm happy to turn it over to you. 
Thank you, and Chair Paisley, Commissioners, I appreciate the opportunity to respond to this request. So we are asking the Commissioners to allow us to increase the monthly compensation for our board members from um, $100 uh, a month, which I think was set some 25 years ago, to $300 per month. We've done an analysis of compensation for um, other school systems in the area, uh, some adjacent, some not. Uh, at, at almost 23,000 students, the compensation for our board members is the lowest at about $100 uh, per month. Uh, two school systems that we compare ourselves to regularly, uh, Davidson uh, County, which is at about 18,005 students, uh, compensates their board members at $240 per meeting with an additional $150 per meeting for the chair. Uh, Rowan Salisbury, which is at about the same number of students, compensates their board members at $350 per month with an additional $100 per month for the chair. We have several school systems that uh, serve a smaller number of students that uh, also compensate their board members at a, an amount that is higher than our uh, current compensation. So we're asking the uh, commissioners to consider to allow us to raise our board member compensation from $100 a month to $300 a month, which we think is a, a moderate increase uh, given the analysis that we have uh, it's budgeted. It's included in our current budget. Um, we're not asking for any additional resources to make that this uh, happen, but it requires the, the um, our commissioners to take action in order for us to be able to do that. Effective one. Yeah, I've. Um, I'll make a motion to approve well, it. I'd, I'd like to, I'll, I'll join that motion. <laughs> Can we both make that motion? Sure. I, I feel like uh, at $100 a month, they're not covering their gas expenses. Um, For what they have to do, yeah. Because I see them all over. I see them going to school, after school, and so forth. Um, Steve, you make the motion. I'll make the second. I just did. Oh, um, you'll do the second. <laughs> Because I, I think it's well deserved, um, and obviously none of your board members, Dr. Benson, are there because of the salary. I assure you. <laughs> no, sir. And, um, and, and, I, and just to be clear, the board did not ask that I uh, try to improve their compensation. Uh, I just, I, quite frankly, I just think it's the right thing to do. Any other comment from the board? I just totally agree. I mean, I just totally agree because you look at Caswell, they have 2,308 students. They have one high school, one middle school, and four elementaries, and they get well over $600 a month. And um, and this, the Board of Education works just as hard as the commissioners or any other group that leads. They're the highest employer in this county and a, a tremendous budget. And you do work a lot of hours. You really do. I just come off of it after eight years. And you don't run for office. To make money, you run for office to make a difference, and um, I, I totally agree with this. Amen. So, a quick comment, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I um, I don't always agree with uh, decisions of the Board of Education, and I'm sometimes frustrated by their inaction. Something I'd like to talk about uh, during the commissioner comments tonight. Um, but um, regardless of whether I disagree or agree, they're all able public servants, a great personal sacrifice, and uh, they've been undercompensated for two decades. Um, so, I'd support it. I agree. If there are no other comments, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 There being no one to oppose it, thank you. <laughs> Unanimous. Dr. Benson, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go into the veterans uh, trip uh, travel compensation. Compensation is probably not correct. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, you have in your packet uh, a request for out-of-state travel for uh, Commissioner Thompson, Tammy Crawford, who is the director of our Veteran Services Organization, uh, Veteran Service Office, and myself to go to Kansas City, Missouri, to tour the Veterans Community Project. The dates of travel would be August 4th through 6th 
uh, next month. Uh, in Kansas City, uh, we've had some discussions with the folks uh, that are with this nonprofit Veterans Community Project. They serve homeless veterans uh, in Kansas City. I believe they have nonprofits in other cities across the country. And uh, the idea would be to go to Kansas City, meet with the folks that uh, have organized this nonprofit, and put this, let's say, a tiny home village for homeless veterans, uh, transit, uh, transitionary housing for homeless veterans. They also offer uh, wraparound services for these veterans to get them, the goal is to get them into their own homes, working uh, and uh, off of any substance abuse that they may have. The goal would be to go to Kansas City and learn more about how they do that, what it might take to get that nonprofit here, who all was involved in setting that up, what it might look like in Alamance County. So I know Mr. Thompson's had uh, uh, a lot of interest in serving veterans of Alamance County, so I don't want to speak for, for Commissioner Thompson, but that, I think that's the gist of the mm -hmm. travel. So. And, and they Ms. are, Crawford I'm sorry, is, sorry, 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 go ahead, John. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, here. Tammy, come on up. I didn't, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. I, I was looking for you. No, that's okay, no problem. Would you like to add anything, Tammy? I'm sorry. I didn't you covered it very it. well. I know Pam has spoke to the gentleman we're gonna meet in Kansas City, so. I haven't got to talk to him as much as she does, but super excited about this project and finding out if we can bring something like this to this county. Do you have any questions? I'd and like to know how it would be funded. So the Veterans Service Department had funds uh, for travel in their budget last fiscal year that were not able to be used because of COVID. Veterans Service officers usually travel to state or national conferences and have training events, but uh, needless to say, all of those things were canceled. Uh, we would be coming to the commissioners next month asking for funds to be designated from their budget from last fiscal year and the dollar amount needed to fund this travel in this fiscal year. And, and give us, I know we have it in paper, but now see amount of the travel and the uh, and what does it cover? I'm sure it, plane flights, hotel room, what it, what's covered? Indeed, uh, the total cost of the trip uh, for all three individuals is uh, two thousand two hundred and sixteen dollars, eight hundred seventy six dollars for lodging. I believe that's for two nights of stay. Um, travel for the airplane tickets one thousand one hundred and sixty dollars, meals one hundred and eighty dollars. So total cost two thousand two hundred and sixteen dollars. And we have um, funds, as he said, designated. We did not get to participate in any of our conferences due to COVID, so there was quite a bit left over for no travel, no training. As I understand, the Veterans Community Project has, they've got one location in Kansas City now and they're looking to expand. Is that right? Yes. Is, there any, is there anything that makes us think that they would want to come to Alamance County as opposed to other large metropolitan areas? That yeah. Have? Me. <laughs> could you could you refuse me? I mean, I've been Hinder Scott, my new best friend. Um, I mean, I've been on the phone with him, and I mean, this has been a, a passion of mine. I mean, mm. and this is a 49 site home that they do. They can have their spouses there and a pet, and they've got the center that's on site. They're located where they've got water and sewer. City Transit comes back there, and like um, Brian said. This is strictly transitional. This is to get them on their next way. You're a lawyer, you're a lawyer. You know that not all veterans come out of service like they went in. And, um, and they can, we all can make terrible mistakes. We've heard about drugs and you can tie this in there together with addictions and all kind of stuff. And um, there, there just is not enough that we can do for the very people that go to serve our country. And, um, and I asked Ben, I said, how in the world did you come up with this? He said, four Marines in a bar. So that told me everything. That told me that this has been a dream of theirs. They are self-funded. Um, and, and I asked him, would he move here? And he said, you know, I don't know. <laughs> and so anyway, um, this is, I just, you know, we go all over the place for training for all kind of things. And I'll be honest with you, I've offered to pay my way because I don't want anybody saying anything about it. That's probably, I mean, I just don't want anybody saying about it. And I still will be glad, more than glad to pay my way. And if I won the lottery, this wouldn't be on because I'd already built it myself. <laughs> and um, so I just think this is um, something that, you're a veteran, Craig, I mean, an awesome veteran. I'm the mother of one and the recent, uh, and the mother of a recent veteran. 
And I, we just can't give back enough to this this population that, that has served for us. I think it's time we were serving for them. And they always seem to be last on the list. And we may go out there, and this may be nothing that could ever work, but when he told me they're looking to open this up in eight cities across the United States of America, we've got a lot of veterans here, and we've got a great community with great leadership right here in this room. And we've got folks all over this county, I know, that would really support this. And so I, I, I'm just 100% about it. And I promise you, these three, we will have masks on, on the airplane. So we will not be spreading any kind of cooties since I've got the <laughs> shot anyway, I'm vaccinated. So um, I, just, I just felt the need to say that because I know this was on consent agenda and whoever called about it, that's fine. But um, I think this is something that um, we're going with a former Marine. I don't think we'll be safe. So, but um, I just, I can't wait for us to look at something like this. I don't, why would Alamance County not want to try for something like this and be the role model for our entire state? So. Well, Pam, I think I know you well enough to know you're not going to make a motion to approve this because you're a, a subject in it. No, I won't touch it. I totally agree. <laughs> I will make a motion. I believe that the very term homeless veteran is a travesty. You're right. I mean, we shouldn't be supporting anybody else before we support our veterans. And those are the people that have fought to protect us and give us the <clears> rights <throat> and the protection that we have in this country now. So I'll make a motion to approve this uh, travel expense. And I, if I can add this caveat, I don't want to allow Pam to pay her own way. Well, I, I really don't mind. Let me ask one, one other question before we go further with Steve's motion. Um, beyond this travel cost, what cost would, would this cost Alamance County? I think the nonprofit, they move in and mm -hmm. fund their own projects, do they not? Yeah, this has nothing to do with the TAX word or anything that we would have to make a motion on. And um, it would be solely self, I mean, they're going on three years and they have, they have done it right because they believe in what they've done. That's the biggest part. And uh, we've got a bunch of veterans that have done really well in this county that would probably really want to be part of something so amazing. And uh, I just think we're a county that can, can do something like this. We do things really good, and we need to do things even better than what we're doing good, and this would be one of them. So you think the project itself would be funded by the nonprofit and or mm -hmm. the Veterans right. Association? Is that your understanding? That's what I'm understanding. I guess right. when we go out there, I want more facts about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I looked all over the country for something like this, and um, and I mean I've really researched this because it's just I mean I ran for office on this. I wanted the Kernersville site, was a hundred million dollar building. I just wasn't going to work, and so um, you know we got to start somewhere. And you can go to the jail and talk to a veteran. You can go find a veteran up on Bass Mountain. You can go find veterans all over the place. And uh, I just I can't believe that we would um, not want to honor them after they do everything for us. That's why we're able to sit here and have a conversation. So it's that important. Do, do we know when they're going to make a decision on the eight cities that they're going to no. um, expand I'm, to? I'm not aware of, no. Okay. Eight. eight. Um, well, if we're going to do it, let's do it right. Let's find out as much as we can before we go out there. Let's um, uh, let's put together a package. Let's, let's do it right. Let's have some property in mind. If we're going to go for it, then let's go for it. You could get a jet and fly out there. You know? I could. Just, <laughs> just to, you know, oil your skills up. So. It's rusty. Rusty. It wouldn't be good. <laughs> I know it's going to be able to work. That's one of the best baseball stadiums in the country out there. Kansas City Royals. At Kansas City. You What's his name, to... Mahoney? What's that guy that plays football? Oh, for Mahomes. Oh, Mahomes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like um, Patriots. Sorry. Now I like Tampa. Yeah, I Tampa. Right. Announcement. Uh, I'll second it. All right. Motion. Have a motion and a second. Um, any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank I didn't you. vote. Right. I didn't vote. Uh, you have to vote one okay, way. Yes. A, it's a positive vote okay, if yes. you don't. I didn't want to mess up. All right. Thank you. Show those unanimous vote. Please. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Ms. Crawford, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Mr. Hager. Uh, Commissioner, you have information uh, in your packet about uh, back on June 1st of this year, 
our, our local management entity managed care organization Cardinal Innovations announced <clears throat> that they would be merging with Via Health. Uh, that announcement was sent out to all the Cardinal counties on June 1st. And uh, the counties that were in the Cardinal Innovations catchment area were given the option by the state of North Carolina to either remain with uh, a VIA led LME MCO, which uh, eventually VIA will become the lead agency over the, the VIA Cardinal uh, merger, or to go through the disengagement process and find a new LME MCO. Uh, we understand the VIA merger will be completed by June 30th of 2022. So on June 7th, uh, the county commissioners asked Chair Paisley and um, Commissioner Turner to lead a committee to have a group of discussions and interview various LME MCOs to try to figure out in a very short amount of time what, what should the county do, what's the best next step for Alamance County for a mental health LME MCO. Uh, we put together a committee that consisted of Chair Paisley, Commissioner Turner, County Attorney Clyde Albright, Deputy County Attorney Ben Pierce, Assistant County Manager Sherry Hook, DSS Director Adrian Day, Gary Ander, who works at the Alamance County Sheriff's Office but was a, um, a mental health professional with the LME here in Alamance County, as well as Linda Jones, who was also a mental health professional from uh, Alamance Caswell Mental Health and worked at DSS too, and myself. This committee interviewed uh, representatives from VIA, Sand Hills and Alliance, those are all three um, uh, LME MCOs that are, VIA obviously is our uh, one that we're going to be with uh, in the Cardinal picture. Sand Hills and Alliance are also um, contiguous to our county region. So we interviewed represent, uh, representatives from all three of those LME MCOs. And the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services has asked that all Cardinal counties let the department know of our selection by tomorrow, July 20. So this has been a very fast moving process. Uh, the county's had since July, excuse me, June 1 until tomorrow to let the state of North Carolina know who we select. Um, and so we have, as Mr. a committee- Let me interrupt you there. Yes, sir. Uh, just so the folks out in the audience know, we thought we had more time. Yes. And you got an email last Thursday? Indeed, uh, you know, I've been communicating with uh, the deputy secretary of the department that we had a committee we were moving forward with our board's uh, 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 discretion to select. We knew this was very important. And then we got an email fairly recently. Uh, Last Wednesday. That's correct. Uh, saying that we had until July 20. So the state of North Carolina is in a, a big rush to get all of these Cardinal counties in with an LME MCO. It has to do with the fact they're doing this tailored plan, this new model for uh, mental health service provision and Medicaid. So they are in a huge rush to get that done, and they really need every county that was formerly Cardinal to commit so they'll know how to divvy up these tailored plans. So uh, in that short amount of time, I will commend all these folks that served on this committee. We appreciate their uh, commitment to try to help us select the best LME MCO for our residents. That was, without doubt, the committee's uh, guiding light, I would say, was to try to find the best fit for, for our citizens. Um, at this point, um, the committee is prepared to recommend to the commissioners via health. Uh, we uh, spent time with them. We've spent time with them in person. We've also spent time with them in multiple conference calls. So the committee is recommending via health. We have the CEO of VIA with us this evening, uh, Mr. Brian Ingram. And Brian has a presentation he'd like to do for the commissioners. I think it'll be valuable for the, for the board to see. So, Brian, if you'd like to come on up. I think Bruce has a clicker for you. Mr. Haygood, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, good to see you again, Commissioners. Uh, first off, appreciate all the time you've been willing to spend with us. Um, you know, we've met with a lot of counties. Your due diligence process has been uh, very, very thorough. So in terms of meeting the needs of your community, I, I give you an A+. Um, first thing I would say before we even get started with this, this is our uh, fourth consolidation. It's a, we're in a volatile business, okay? Healthcare in, gen in general, and in particular, the LME MCO world is, is pretty confusing for folks, and there's been um, some organizations that have been less successful than others. We've always kind of come out on top. Um, we know all that is involved with, with taking on an effort like this. 
I think is is really what I want to leave you with. Um, the way we approach this is for it to be absolutely seamless for members and for providers. <clears throat> and that's really how we measure our success um, because we don't want anything in this transition to be any more upsetting than all of what is you know, currently involved with Medicaid transformation. You've had the standard plans go live July 1st. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a barrel rolling downhill at this point. So our job is to make it absolutely uh, seamless. And, and we've, we've got a very good track record with that. So if that inspires some, some confidence, I hope you can uh, appreciate that. Um, the last time when we met was a call, and I think you had seven or eight questions for me. And I did my best to, to cover those, and it seemed that those are perhaps the issues that rose to the top of the list in terms of what was most concerning. So what I did was just, you know, put together uh, those responses, and if you'd like, we could just kind of talk through that. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Local presence. Uh, there's uh, an existing lease at 2929 Kraus Lane, Suite B in Burlington that Cardinal has that we uh, will have that lease assigned to us and that will give us a, a apparently wonderful office space both in terms of um, providing a, a setting for families to come in, providers to come in. Um, you know, since COVID has hit, that's really changed everything in terms of office space and remote work and currently about 80% of our employees are in permanent remote work status. So we currently have employees that work for us that are all over the state. But they do need space to come in and meet with families, meet with providers. Um, so this would be an excellent place for that. Um, as I understand at a large conference room, we do a lot of things in terms of training for the communities and education and hold meetings. So it'd be great to be able to do that uh, here in Alamance County. Uh, some of the other things that are just very, I would say, typical for us, um, and when we met with uh, your DSS director, and I think in the initial meeting we had, we talked about um, just our presence and, uh, you know, having one of our workers at DSS embedded is something we offer to all of our DSSs, and we've been doing that for 15 years. Um, so we're proud of those relationships, and, you know, over that time, you, know, you really get to um, appreciate how much you need one another. You know, we're all saving the same folks. So the office space is in addition to the normal things we do. Um, sometimes it could be public help, but typically DSS likes to take advantage of that. And of course, we're going to hire folks that live in your community and, and work here in your community. So it's, uh, um, you know, just the ongoing commitment we've had whenever we've done this before. Hospital contracts, and I would tell you that this is, <clears throat> I don't foresee any problems at all here. Um, the way this works out is any existing provider contract that Cardinal has is assigned to us. So all of the folks that are going to whatever hospitals now from Alamance County and they're being paid by Cardinal, it'll just default to us. Um, we probably have all of those contracts anyway it's just the nature of, of how this works out now, where we have contracts, you know, really just all over the state, and again with all the major health systems. So I don't see that being a, um, you know, a challenge in any way, shape, or manner. And you please stop me here, because I'm just going to keep rolling and try to save you time, but I don't want to rush through things. Okay? All right. Uh, there was a question on the call about system of care, and you know, there's a lot. Um, people that are invested in this, they could come here and talk to you about it for half a day. <clears throat> it really represents a philosophy, you know, that we have supported for years and years and years. Um, and, you know, my academic training is in social work. It, it's systems theory, really. It looks at all the different parts of the community engaged with youth and families. And, you know, if you do this work long enough, you recognize that, you know, if you're going to do anything good, you better be working with all of those groups. And in, in shorthand, that's really what system of care represents. Uh, I mentioned uh, in, in one of the meetings we had, we rarely go after grants. They end up being a lot of work, um, you know, and a lot of times they're hard to sustain themselves. But I got my arm twisted behind my back on this one, and we got a, 
$4.9 million grant from SAMHSA really to support system of care in it's seven or eight of our, of our western county. So uh, I guess uh, our efforts there have been recognized and we'll use that to, to bolster work that we already do. And of course we bring all of this same philosophy to, to LMNs. What was a system of care approach beneficial to the individuals that need care? Uh, well, the grant is probably the easiest, you know, focal point of that. It, it's less about, you know, in this case, it's a, it's funding to engage and increase access. It's less about a particular program per se. It's but I mean, more about more, a philosophy. More about a particular individual, not so much the program. Oh. I mean, for, for the patient. Uh huh. How does it? How does that approach benefit a, a particular patient? It allows greater access to care. Um, you know. It, especially with DSS folks, you know, more engagement on the ground with individuals, additional support. We're able to bolster what we would normally do. And one of the things that, and I think it talks about it here somewhere, um, uh, family support and peer support, which is one of the things we're very heavily involved with. We're normally, um, you know, we have that as adjunct to our uh, member services and our call center, but we would have extra individuals in that role uh, providing assistance to community members. So essentially that's someone with lived experience um, who's able to engage in, you know, maybe a more personal way. Same thing with the uh, a family uh, support member. As a family, as a family member, you have a, an individual who is receiving service or receiving care. So you're able to relate to the individual parent in a different way than a professional. So those are a couple of ways that we augment what we normally do to, I guess, reflect those those values. Does that cover it? Okay. Uh, let's see. DSS. A lot of lot of a uh, lot of attention on DSS these days, and especially youth and and placements for youth. And this is just an area where we have had close relationships for years. Um, and I don't know whether it's the rural nature. I think it might have something to do with it. You know, it's kind of like, you know, your neighbors in the country. I live in the country, you know. You never know when you might need to borrow something for your neighbor, so you better not get, you know, in any kind of fights with them because sooner or later you'll need something and, and they'll need you. So, um, you know, we've always been deeply engaged with our DSSs. Um, we have just a, a, an ongoing protocol where we meet with the DSSs, really it's their call. It's as often as once a month or as infrequent as quarterly, but we have a pretty informal agenda and it's really about, you know, what's working, what's not working. Um, so we're able to, you know, just, you know, be on the same team. And, and a lot of times, I think a lot of the challenges you might read about have to do with situations where, you know, it's this, as opposed to everybody kind of pulling together um, to meet the needs, especially of youth. Um, there's a lot of accountability with that. That's one of the things I really like to stress. You know, who hasn't gone to a meeting and talked about a lot of great things, and then it's like, did somebody write that down? Or who's going <laughs> to do what? And when is that going to get done? So we really uh, we, we keep everyone on our toes with that. So again, we would bring that same, you know, same approach here into all the new counties that, that we work with. A lot of representation um, with DSS and Health and Human Services from counties on our board as well. So there, there's a, a lot of accountability there. And yeah, it, it's problem solving, you know? Um, just being in conversation with people, and of course we used to do all of these face-to-face -face, and now it's kind of a more hybrid thing. It's a lot easier if you just sit across from one another and, and talk about problems and solve them. And we've had good luck with that. And, you know, just in general, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of opportunities um, for people to be engaged with us. You know, certainly there's the board of directors, and I think that might be the next, next slide. We're very, very active with our CFAC, um, our uh, Children Family Advisory Council, which again goes to um, individuals with lived experience, and there's a CFAC board. Um, we're projecting having four CFAC members on our new board 
you know, so we're very invested in, I guess I'll say again, you know, kind of how things are going. You know, we want to have good perspective um, from the community and not always from, from professionals. I mean, we're good with that, but also at a, at a grassroots level. Uh, one of the things that we do to make it just as easy as possible for counties is have a, a community relations director that is just, you know, I think of them, they're like water. You know, they're into, they, they kind of get into everything. <laughs> So they would routinely come to your county commissioner meetings. They would be at the DSS board meetings. They would be engaged with any kind of projects that you have going in the community and really just be at a very grassroots level available to a county for whatever issues uh, might need to be addressed. And we have a very good process of keeping them engaged with our provider network and our care managers so that everybody's kind of on the same page when it comes to county affairs. And of course, County Commissioner Advisory Board, again, there's just a long um, list of, of ways that people can be involved. The board structure. <clears throat> you know, there is the statute that has, you know, very prescriptive requirements around membership. Uh, there is a little caveat there that allows the secretary to approve an alternate board structure. And I think uh, the department feels appreciative, yeah, I think that's fair to say, appreciative of the effort that we've taken on here with this consolidation and recognizes the need for county engagement and will provide an opportunity for us to have an alternate board structure. Now, what does that mean? I can't tell you. Um, the business of the joint steering committee, uh, that is the group of, it's essentially an ad hoc committee from the BIA board and the Cardinal board is meeting together to oversee, I guess you could say, the, the whole consolidation effort. And one of the big challenges that they've had is been looking at what would be an appropriate board structure. Uh, there's two, there's three county commissioners on that group. So there's a lot of sensitivity to keeping counties engaged. I think this is our best thinking at this point. Um, and we're open for suggestions, you know, working within, you know, probably one standard deviation from the law. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can just go off, you know, too far. Um, but recognizing that we would have, you know, a large number of counties, probably five regions is about what it looks like. And when we know for sure which counties will be part of the effort, you know, we'll have a good idea of how it might make sense to you know, compose these regions and, of course, you know, talk with you about, about that. So have, um, you know, some structure to the county commissioner advisory boards, which we currently have. You know, we have a, a 22 county one. It's just a, a committee of the whole, essentially. And the chairperson of that, that's Ronnie Beal, and he, in turn, is, is on our board, and he kind of acts as a liaison. What we're thinking about here is that each one of those regional cabs would be somewhat independent and would each nominate a member or members from their region. So if you're in a region with three or four or five other counties, it's up to that cab to nominate a member for the board of directors and then to conduct their business as a cab as well. That's in addition to the four uh, CFAC representatives. So that's been <clears throat> the model that's, you know, seems to be the most um, utilitarian at this point that we've that we've come up with, and of course we'll have to reconstitute the board and and look at all of that. But you know, that that's, seems to be where we're headed right now. Your comment about the crisis center, diversion center, sir. Um, we have five of them currently, and uh, very very proud to say the. We have one dedicated to youth, which was the second one ever opened in the state. Uh, four others in different parts of our region. Uh, we know that business very, very well. And knowing that there was such an interest here, our folks, and I hope they didn't get ahead of themselves with going out and doing a bunch of legwork, but you know, we knew that it was you know, an issue that was, had a lot of attention and sensitivity. They've already identified a site. I think that's a rendering of it. Um, I've got the address here somewhere. It's right across from Alamance Regional. 
Um, RHA is one of our major providers. We work with very, very closely. So we've already kind of tipped our toes in the water around a feasibility. And as it was, the developer had planned on using it for a medical facility, um, could easily pivot to be, you know, what we would think of as a facility-based crisis program and other components that include diversion as well as the ability for short-term stabilization. So it's exactly, you know, what you were, what you were addressing. Um, and again, I, I, you, you could have full confidence in our ability to do these. Now, there's an asterisk at the end of this. And this goes to our, our conversation when we were on the phone. I think it's great that we've done all of this legwork. We know a lot about this line of service, a, a lot. Right now, we're, we're kind of in a, in a phase where we need to look at what the impact of the standard plans is going to be on this service line. And it's a revenue issue for providers. And I'm afraid your eyes would glaze over if I kind of went into it, but you know, take a leap of faith with me here. Uh, we need to look at what the impact of that is going to be on providers conducting this service level so that we can properly um, scale it and, and look at what the funding is going to be. Um, you mentioned the cost associated with this. Very, very expensive. The primary reason, and again, this I I'm, give this to you as an apolitical statement. You know, we are in a state that has not expanded Medicaid. There are thousands and thousands of individuals who go without care. Uh, facilities like this, probably 60 to 70 percent of the individuals that use a facility like this do not have Medicaid. And that is where we have the biggest gap between need and dollars. Okay, it's like this. You know, the needs here, the dollars are here. So it's really, really tough doing these services. Um, so again, the, the conservative approach around waiting is really in, in respect for that. But, you know, I've kind of told them, hold your horses. You know, I'm coming here tonight. Let's, let's get things situated. And then um, but certainly the legwork is there, and it looks like that would be an excellent facility to, to work with. And in, in RHA, the provider we're working with um, has probably, yeah, they have our largest facility. So we've done this with them before. In fact, did you guys go and visit this? I think the sheriff and several folks uh, went to Buncombe okay. County and visited the uh, one in Buncombe. <laughs> we had people from all over the all over the country visit that. It's just a showcase of a facility as it as it should be. That's the question mark for questions. I know I just ripped through that because I wanted to um, you know cover the bases, but certainly happy to answer any questions you might have. I'll ask something. Sure. Okay, RHA is going to still be our people. Correct. Okay, because they do a really good job. And, I, you yeah. know, I've heard a lot about Cardinal Elevations, whatever you want to say about it, but um, they've done a lot for this county. Mm -hmm. They started out doing a lot for this county, and mm -hmm. it's kind of like one of those situations. Um, you talk about it, you talk about it, and you have no idea what's going to come running through the door when you finally open it, and it will blow your mind away because you don't realize just how, how much of a hot mess we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And it's just the normal. It really is. Um, we've, we've got a lot of situations that are just heartbreaking. Oh. And um, this, I, I just, you know, CID training, they went through our police department, training them how to handle crisis situations. I even role played. Imagine that. Good for you. Gonna jump off a bridge. I was could have got an Oscar. And so anyway, um, I'm just Good. I'm just saying that I don't I don't want people to blow Cardinal out of the water like whatever because they've done a lot for this county. Um, they trained Meredith Pepley, who's the director over Crossroads right now, was their rep, and she trained all of my volunteers how to handle a suicide call because you never know what's going to call a crisis line. They're, they did excellent work, and there's probably a lot of things that people don't even know they did, and, and I just want to really yeah. let them know how much we appreciate yeah. that. What makes you different from Cardinal? I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know of you. Please forgive me. Mm -hmm. I just don't, and that's why you're mm -hmm. here, and I want to know, mm -hmm. like, um, how do you come in to take this and form this bridge and uh -huh. are you going to be in face because the la I'm going to tell you I, I do interviews at the jail work with my husband and, and I have the most broken people I work with are drug addiction and it always leads from trauma that started a long time ago that was missed or it's headed that way 
and we have a time finding somewhere for these people to go because they don't have like Blue Cross Blue Shield. They, sometimes they don't have Medicaid. Sometimes they don't have a pillar, let alone anything else. And trying to find all places which range from $25,000 a week to nothing and, and some of the non-paying ones do better service than the, you know, the Hollywood type. Mm -hmm. I just, I really want to know what this is going to do for this population in this county because we have got to face it. It is an evil <clears throat> that is destroying lives. Yeah. And it's huge. Well, you, you gave me a lot of things to respond to. Good, okay. for, good for you. Um, we do a lot of jail services. We do Matt in the jail all over the place I mean let me start at a high level and, and I'll spend as much time you know responding as you can tolerate you know our our approach to all of this has been you know again it's the our, our discovery tour I think the first time we met that's that's what we said we're all about continuing the things that are working well mm -hmm. um, don't want to stop slow down anything I mean it, in this project around the facility-based crisis is a good example of that. It's looking for opportunities to make improvements. And I will tell you that there has been an absolute range from zero to 100 about that, where there have been counties that we've gone to and said, oh my gosh, you know, just don't, don't change anything. It's going great for us. To other counties where it's been, you know, how soon can you do this, 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 and that? So we're in this process of understanding the things that are working well and the things that are not working as well, okay? Yeah. It's a very logical approach. I mean, to speak, you know, you ask, what, what do we, you know, how, do, how are we different? Um, and with, with all due respect to Cardinals, they have been fantastic to work with, okay? It has become very popular to be critical of them. I, I'm not going to do that. Um, did they, have they done some things wrong? Yes, they have. We all do. Right, right. Um, this isn't anything about that. Right. It is about the action of their board. And really, a consolidation like this is a board-to-board -board action. Cardinal got to a point where they believed it was in the best interest of their members, their staff, and the providers that they work with to create a path to the future. It had become so dysregulated with so many counties disengaging that they were afraid that they couldn't properly view the future in a positive light, I guess I could say. Very concerned about their staff, very concerned about their members. They thought the best plan would be for them to take what they had left, give it to another organization that they trusted could do a good job with this they chose us our board said great we we thank you very much we appreciate your trust in us we will do a good job we have a lot of counties like this uh, that was one of the i think one of the criteria that that made them feel good about us what does like this mean in terms of population okay okay you know rather than having big urban counties gotcha. where you get a lot of clashing and I think, you know, that was one of the challenges that, that Cardinal faced. So, you know, we don't have that, for example. Okay, we're all, you know, pretty well stratified in terms of, of population. You guys would be big. You'd be very big for us. I think our average county size is, I don't know, just under 50,000. Um, so the, our ability to, to do what we do in a rural to suburban environment uh, is fantastic. When you look at our performance, we are first or second in everything that we are measured on. And there are things called performance targets, and there's a report card, and again, there's a whole other part of the presentation we shared with the group. Um, we're one of only two LME MCOs in the state, and the other one is not Cardinal, you know, that is all, you know, all A's on that. So what that means is the things that the state considers most important, um, access to care, um, responsiveness to individuals when they're discharged from the hospital, um, things like that. Um, our evaluation is at, at the highest level. So you're getting probably the best performing LME MCO in the state, okay? Cardinal 
you know, wasn't, didn't, didn't have those same grades. So there's a, a differentiator. One of the things that, uh, that, you know, that we have seen in going around and talking to counties and, and really learning from the Cardinal staff that will be different is the ability for our folks who are on the ground, um, you know, the, the community relations workers, uh, the care management staff, for them to identify issues and seek resolution in a quick manner. Um, it, it seems to me that there was not a, a real fluid process for Cardinal around that. So you had a lot of folks doing a lot of good work in the community, but when it came to making a decision or making a change that was needed, it was like that process of getting to there and then getting back down was terribly, terribly frustrating for people. I mean, we've just heard that over and over and over and over again. Promises that were made, you know, deadlines that weren't made, um, those kinds of things. Our architecture for doing that is fundamentally different. Um, we, it's called our, our Community 360, where we engage the community relations uh, specialists who will be dedicated for your county, um, care coordination, that's on the ground people you know, that live here in your community, work with your uh, members, and then provide our network. Those folks that are intimately involved with the dealings of, of like RHA, they're like, like that, okay? So we'll, we have, you come to join us, we'll have an Alamance County huddle, okay? Where representatives from all three of those departments will be together sharing information about Oh, what's going on? What do we need to do? What about this? What about that? That's just, you know, again, fundamentally different. Um, the way we, I say the other thing, and then I'm going to stop because I, I don't want to take too much of your time here. A relationship with providers is much more, I don't know if intimate is the right word, but they're, look, at, we're only as good as the providers are. That, that's how it is in the business that we're in. So we work very, very, very closely with our providers. And we use contracting in a way different from how Cardinal has, where we're able to probably monitor the deliverable in a much more specific way. And the other side of the coin is we're ready to go more at risk for the provider too. We have certain approaches to the way we fund where we have a subcapitated model where they don't have to go out and it's not like retail, you know, where there's a reimbursement for every person that comes in. We give them a lump each month and say, you go do your good work, we'll settle up at the end of the year. So if you have a bad month, you don't have to worry about making payroll. It's things like that that we've learned over time that make a big difference. Just one more thing. Sure. Um, Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. I sit on that along with the DSS board. That's a whole, holy cow. Are you going to be affiliated with our young people? Oh, yeah. Because it's just, it's, it starts so, so yeah. young. Yeah. And, um, and we just need to just invest everything we can in our, they're our very future. Yeah. And sometimes they can't pick their parents, and we see the outcomes of that. And I think there's a... I think there's a big quote in here from uh, the juvenile just, justice director out in our um, out in our part of the state. Somewhere in here, yeah, we we have great r relationships with those folks. Well, we've got um, some really fine agencies that serve this population that are hungry for what you're talking about, and uh, they just cannot be neglected because it's 24/7. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I, I think uh, it would be good to highlight one particular point Mr. Ingram made, uh, which is about the decision-making issue. I don't think I can overstate the frustration that this county has felt with, um, with hard cases, particularly around young people, mm -hmm. uh, when we just need a decision about what care is appropriate and <coughs> what care will mm -hmm. be recommended. And, and to have that elongate, to have that decision-making process mm -hmm. elongate, particularly with the juvenile, is maddening. Mm -hmm. And when we talked to, to VIA, I think the group got a really good sense um, about responsiveness 
about their responsiveness and about their particular attention, um, personal attention. And, th and that may be a, as, a, mm -hmm. as a result of your, of your coming up in mostly rural counties. Um, but those two items, I think, counter, w spoke to what the county perceived as a significant problem. Is, is having the relationships where I think he even said in one of the meetings, Mr. Ingram said, you know, we're going to have hard cases, but we're going to be a partner with you, and we're going to mm -hmm. work, we're going to work it together, and that is a significant uh, mindset. I think would yeah. helped the board come to this decision, Mr. Chairman. I think it may be helpful. Miss Day is on uh, the DSS director is on the on Zoom. It may be helpful just to have her perspective. Oh, sure. On on uh, on this decision. I, I totally. Let me just kind of give you folks out here an idea of what we did. We spent a lot of time, and Mr. Turner, uh, Mr. Haygood, Sherry Hook, uh, our committee spent a lot of time uh, going over and meeting with all the different groups that we could. Um, we met with several in person, and obviously with your group. Uh, and then we got down to the final decision, and the state putting pressure on us to make a quicker decision than they had earlier told us. Uh, this gentleman gave us his personal cell number. How many CEOs of LMEs give you their personal cell number to make us have a better decision? Uh, I was very, very impressed with everything that you folks uh, did during our meetings and, and so forth. Um, and every question that I had in our final phone conversation, uh, you addressed directly uh, DSS, uh, RHA, everybody uh, pretty much unanimously wanted you to be our provider. Thank you. Um, and so if we can hear from DSS, Adrian, are you with us? Single point of assessment. I am here. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. Um, I, I would agree with everything that you just said, Commissioner Paisley. Um, we have spoken with Brian several times and um, he has always answered our questions. I've actually spoken to some of the other um, folks from VIA and they've been very responsive and um, I, I feel comfortable with the county uh, going with VIA as our mental health provider. Can you elaborate when you mentioned jail a while ago? You're involved with jail because that's just a place to find it. It really is. Well, there are different services that our providers are involved with, and it really, it really goes county by county, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, counties have different needs in terms of what they want to see done with their uh, incarcerated individuals. I know that one of the big ones is uh, medication assisted treatment. Right. So we have that in many of our counties and I can't tell you all the you ones that You're talking about Suboxone and things like that? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. So while the individual is in jail, right. you know, the treatment has begun. They will also uh, get naloxone before yeah. they're released because of the risk of relapse. Um, other assessments that we do for individuals when they come into the criminal justice system. Those are typically the, the types of things that um, counties are looking for with, with jail services. And, and I just, I'm just so, and do you guys ever get involved with uh, possibly if a county has a drug court? Are oh you, yeah, yeah. Are you, do you facilitate yep. stuff like yep. that? Diversion courts, mm -hmm. sure, right. yeah, all, all of that. You know, whatever you have, you know, we're going to help you build it. I mean, well, I'm very interested in that because okay. that's, uh, that's, a, that's huge. That's uh -huh. so needed here. There's a lot of needs here. Well, I'll hook you up with Donald Bruce, who's our uh, vice president of network. I mean, he'd be here all night talking to you about all the different things that you know, he's probably already thought about, doesn't dare tell me yet. But you now he's really, he's great with these things. Well, I've got two amazing judges. Here Good. in County that would love Good. to lead that. So. Good. Well, I think we have more than two. Yeah, but <laughs> two have actually said it. So. <laughs> yeah. You know, my cell phone number is on my business card. So um, it's just how I do my job. Um, I don't, you know, honestly, I appreciate the compliment. I don't think there's anything special about it. 
It's just, <laughs> you know, it's just what I do. And, you know, how helpful was it, you know, for you folks when you wanted, you had a bunch of questions you just wanted to get answers to. I mean, Let's talk about the crisis center hours. Sure. Uh, that's something that we talked about, I guess, this past Wednesday mm -hmm. uh, on the telephone. We are trying to expand the crisis center hours. We have expanded it to some degree. Uh, and you indicated that you would be willing to look into that and mm -hmm. do what we can to mm -hmm. continue that. I'd love to have it a 24-hour center. Yeah. And, and the cost is mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the stopping point, I, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is really about service to the uninsured. I mean, it, there isn't that, – that's it. Um, it's $2.5 a year just on providing care to individuals who do not have Medicaid. I'd say two and a half to, to three, probably. And until we can feel more comfortable knowing that number for sure, because of the changes with the standard plans coming in, that's why we're sort of saying, let's just, you know, really pay attention here for probably three, four months. You also mentioned uh, having either monthly, quarterly, whatever, with DSS mm -hmm. uh, and the Sheriff's Department, various mm -hmm. departments. Would you address that? Yeah. I, you know, we go where you take us. I mean, it's really, it's really that, uh, you know. And again, the, the community relations directors, those are the folks that are going to be very engaged and be kind of taking the temperature on all of these things. So if you've got a lot of interest around services in the jail, they're going to ping that, okay, and they're going to get network involved with working with you around that. Um, if there's, oh, we have, you know, uh, programs with law enforcement where uh, they have iPads, okay, so that they can have assistance with evaluations. We've, you know, the CIT training, I mean, we've done that to, for thousands and thousands of officers. It's really just meeting your needs. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, you know, your understanding of what you see as the issues and our ability to come in, and, and again, it's not a, you know, <laughs> the checkbook's not unlimited. <laughs> um, but we're transparent about that. And there's a lot of things, you know, again, we've had to figure out how to do things, um, you know, in real creative ways. I'll, I'll put it that way. Now, the Stepping Up Initiative. The, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> is that something that you have checked into where we are for several years now? Is that yeah. something that you guys will involve yourself in oh, to yeah. help really launch that? Oh, my gosh. Ronnie Beal. I think he's like the, the father of that in North Carolina, one of our commissioners. So, yeah, we're all over stepping up. Um, believe me, it, it's, you know, in many, many of our counties. And I know the gentleman, Gary, um, he was particularly interested in that, and we had a whole big dialogue about that. So, Gary yeah. Cole, the sheriff's yeah. department. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I believe Mr. Andrew, he, he is on the call, and I think he might have a just a statement, if that's okay, Mr. Mr. Chairman. So, Gary uh, Andrew. Hey, Gary, can you hear us? Yes, good evening. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, I, I was really impressed with uh, our meeting with VIA and uh, certainly support uh, this decision. I, I do have a concern um, and a question. Um, Brian, when you talk about the pause on crisis services uh, right now to sort of reevaluate where we're at, um, I wonder if that applies to the service definition that Cardinal approved for crisis services last year that allowed crisis services to begin um, an additional 24 hours to cover weekends. No, no, it, it's nothing about that. It is, the simplest way I can explain it is there's a real risk for providers to lose money on individuals who are standard plan members relative to the reimbursement that we used to provide. So we use Medicaid funding to, I'll say, overfund those individuals because we knew there's so many that do not have Medicaid that are so expensive. So we're going to overpay on this side to try to counterbalance for all the folks that, that don't um, that there's much less reimbursement for. 
So some number of those people that we were, I'm just going to say overpaying for, and if you'll give me poetic license here, um, it, it's part of a funding strategy. What we're worried about is those folks that we used to pay a lot more for, now all of a sudden they're over here with standard plan. Well, guess what? Standard plans are not going to do that overpaying like we did. So now all of a sudden the net revenue for the organization goes like this. You know, what, what's that going to look like? You know, who's going to be the backstop for that? Probably we're going to be the backstop. So we need to really kind of get to a point where we can fully understand that. And, um, you know, we're never going to do something that, that I don't want to say can't be sustained. You know, we're not frivolous in the way we go about doing these things. You know, we're not going to have the ribbon cutting and close it in a year. You know, we're just not going to do that. So I'd much rather take some time and evaluate what this impact is going to be. It's not fair to the <coughs> provider. It's not fair to anybody. So that's what it is in simplest terms. Okay, I understand that. Do you assume that there, there will be, there will continue to be state funds to support uninsured folks um, that we will be serving here in Alamance? Yes, that will continue. It has to do with the ratio of the need to those funds. That's the that's the nut right there. Okay, thank you. That that's that's helpful. It it, it sounds to me like we all need to continue to uh, uh, look towards Medicaid expansion for North Carolina. That would certainly help this population. It would be a game changer for us and for many, many, many of your citizens. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The only other point I would make is you have a map in your packet that shows the proposed areas of all the different LME MCOs as best we understand and I did not mention Marlena Isley. Marlena was a part of our committee also, our GIS director, and she created this map on the fly over and over and over again as we heard more <laughs> about how different uh, these Cardinal counties were, what, what, uh, where were they going. So appreciated her work. The map is in there. You can see uh, kind of how things have shook out. I think uh, our county and Warren County are the only two counties in the Cardinal area left that have not, as of um, right now, uh, made a formal decision. But um, appreciated Marlena's help with the map and effort, too. I would indicate, you see what I had sitting out on my desk? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and as you can see, uh, you folks, uh, your largest county in the uh, west is Asheville, Buncombe County, Buncombe. I suppose. And I believe in the central part, will be the largest in this mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Turner, during our discussions, kept talking about uh, with Alliance, for example, uh, we would be a small fish in a big tank, and with you folks, we would be a large fish in a smaller tank. Uh, and I, uh, Mr. Turner, I appreciate that and thought that was a very, very, just a great point. So. Can I ask you one more question? Okay, um, you just stay here as long as you want. Okay, well, I'll watch it. Um, <laughs> Naloxone, Nor Norcan, uh -huh. all that uh -huh. stuff. Um, we had a, a young person to um, present to our North Carolina Child Fatality Task Force Intentional Deaths Committee. And it was about, they were a nonprofit and they were handing out Narcan, handing out, handing out, and, and feeling great, you know. And I asked the question about do you, what kind of data do you keep on that? Are you keeping a, like, John Doe got this, you know, because. In the heaviest of drug addiction, Narcan is just the, to the next high. Mm -hmm. that, you know, death doesn't scare anybody. It's the high that's the power. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you feel about You just mentioned that coming out of jail because sooner or later we have to stand on our own feet. This is, this is horrendous work mm -hmm. and for the rest of someone's life. You, you just don't fix this instantly. It's always chasing somebody. Any kind of addiction is like that. Chocolate, I mean anything. And um, I'm just curious how you feel about that because they're not cheap, you know, because EpiPens cost families so much money and we just hand these out like they're just crayons. And it, it's very concerning to me. Before I came to North Carolina um, 20 years ago, 20 years ago this fall, I was the executive director of a nonprofit that provided services to individuals in recovery some, from substance use little bit of mental illness but mainly substance use and one of the things that 
I ran into all the time was people not being able to fully appreciate addiction. Exactly. Because, I mean, think of how we understand things in our lives. We understand them in the way that we perceive them, right? So, you know, you may choose to have a glass of wine on Friday night or Saturday night, go out and be with friends and do whatever, and you can make a choice about whether you drink or not drink, right? Now, someone like that, when they're confronted with an individual who is addicted, who has a brain disease that is called addiction, which is a chronic health problem, and they think, well, why can't they just experience this substance like I do, okay? That's the, that's the problem, okay? It's very, very difficult for people to understand addiction as a chronic, uh, it's a brain disease that is an, a, a chronic disease like many others that we have in physical health. It's illegal. Uh, there's tremendous stigma. I mean, we've got all of these things kind of uh, piled up against it. Now, you know, the, the point you're going to is whether or not harm reduction, okay? So there's a whole big camp of individuals that say, nope, you can't, you know, you've got to quit. You go cold turkey. You're, you're nothing if you don't do that, right? Versus there's others that feel, well, medication-assisted treatment. You're provided with certain medications that help you get over the addiction. It's, it's evidence-based practice. I mean, it's the best mm -hmm. practice there is. But yet there's a lot of, you know, emotion. Judgment. There's so much judgment. Judgment about all of that. Yeah. Same thing with harm reduction. Yeah. You know, should we be helping someone? You know, should we be helping? How many times should someone be given the opportunity to have their life saved? Uh, I don't have the answers for you, okay? Um, you know, if we were to go around the room tonight, there'd be a lot of different ideas about it. At the end of the day, we believe in harm reduction. If you do not survive, you cannot begin recovery. It's that simple. But there's got to be a next. Mm -hmm. There's always a next. Mm -hmm. And I think our it's, public's got to understand that the wealthiest families in this county have drug addiction in their, fa in their mm -hmm. family. It crosses all lines, just like domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And I think the hardest thing that we're ever going to work with when it comes to this is to get the county to understand it doesn't pick and choose who it wants to destroy mm -hmm. their lives. And um, we got to look at that and not be so judgmental. Because any Thank particular you. day, it could be me. I mean, anybody. It could be anybody. Lord, I'd like to make a motion that we accept via health as our LME MCO provider. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 You have five right. votes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you for your confidence. And we look forward to working with you guys. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Ms. Cattle. Is she here personally or? She is. She is. <laughs> Tanya, you were smarter than everybody else. You stayed in another room. Yeah, I just want to everybody to get a seat in here. <clears throat> All right. Good evening, y'all. On your agenda, you've just got a presentation tonight for the zoning ordinance that we're writing for Snow Camp. This is the first of several that we put in the contract to make sure everybody's informed as we move along. So tonight we have Jake Petrowski here with Stuart. That's the company we hired on. He's going to do a short presentation and we'll take questions or whatever y'all need. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Jake Petrowski. I work with Stuart. I uh, know many of y'all from the land development plan. Uh, this is this is really a implement, Im, implementing a piece uh, of one of the recommendations uh, in that land development plan. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about project schedule and scope, uh, give you a little bit of sense and in, in, in the outline that we're crafting for the, the ordinance, uh, and then uh, talk about next steps and, and kind of what to expect moving forward. Um, the, the summary of the project scope, uh, we're, we're focused on creating zoning districts and dimensional standards for the snow camp area so really the southwest area of the county greater snow camp area 
as instructed by the land development plan uh, and then also create a zoning map for the, the snow camp area. In the land development plan, there was a recommendation uh, to consider implementing uh, additional regulations to manage growth and high impact uses, uh, especially in the snow camp area. Uh, and uh, as part of that, consider some form of zoning in the snow camp area or the county as a whole to observe agricultural character and, and uh, agricultural operations and rural character. So that's really the focus of, of this effort. The project schedule itself, it's not an immediate process. The land development plan kind of created a framework, but we actually have to create the ordinance that implements those ideas in the land development plan. So it's, it's a three-phase project. Uh, we're working with staff uh, really closely right now, uh, developing kind of an ordinance outline on what we're gonna, what we're gonna uh, how we're gonna attack this. Uh, and then we, have, we had a meeting with the planning board uh, we have this meeting to kind of give you all an overview, get some initial feedback. Uh, we're going to begin meeting with the steering committee uh, next week, and they're going to help us uh, answer some questions along with staff to guide, guide the process. There will also be uh, public engagement during this, so there's going to be a public <coughs> workshop coming up. There will be a comment period uh, probably during the month of September uh, that we will uh, solicit feedback from uh, residents and property owners in the, in the snow camp area, and probably some adjustments made. Then we will, we will likely, uh, during that comment period, we will come back to, to you all and talk more about the details of what's in the ordinance, some of the questions or options that, that we're going to be looking at or getting feedback from. And then we'll go back to the steering committee, uh, make some adjustments, have, have another round of public uh, engagement for, for a workshop, uh, probably sometime in October. Then the adoption process begins. Uh, hopefully we, we, we will uh, have addressed any major concerns at that point. It will come before the, the, go to the planning board first and then come back before you all. And at that time, uh, we, will, we will review the ordinance if there are any changes that need to be made or, or final decisions that need to be made, and then it would be approved and, and, and be enacted. So that's kind of the overall schedule. Uh, getting into the details a little bit, I'm not going to get in there too much, but I want to give you a sense and in, in, in what, what the ordinance is going to cover and, and kind of what it's going to look like a little bit. And again, a lot of this came from the land development plan. So the purpose of, uh, of this, this ordinance is to regulate the character of land use and development in the snow camp area. So mitigate conflicts between different land uses. Uh, minimize negative impacts to the natural environment also existing residents uh, and protect local character aesthetics and quality of life so that, that's really the guiding purpose of, of this ordinance uh, it's going to set up a number of different review procedures some of these are already in place there's an administrative review on a lot of uh, things that's that's uh, something that is in, in place currently with your subdivision ordinance so that's going to continue on some things and in certain land uses or development proposal it's going to be an administrative review so it's going to go to Tanya's uh, department and as long as uh, the, the proposal meets uh, identified design criteria and all the uh, requirements, then it'll, it'll be approved. Get a, that development will get an ordinance compliance uh, certificate. Uh, there also uh, is potential for a legislative approval uh, with, with the planning board advising and then the board of commissioners making final decision. Uh, this could be some sort of rezonings could, could fall under this and also any ordinance or tax amendments moving forward would also go under this, this category. Uh, and then there's also an evidentiary or quasi-judicial approval process uh, where uh, uh, the decision would go to the, the board of adjustment and um, the special use permit would also be something. So the special use permit would be another uh, approval process that would need to be made uh, for high impact land uses, especially is something that we, we wanted to, to identify a, a, another use uh, approval process um, for certain high impact land uses in the snow camp area. So those would be under that, uh, that quasi judicial or evidence based uh, approval process. The different zoning districts, these have been outlined in the land development plan. Uh, one is an agricultural district where we want to support agricultural and related uses. Included uh, limited uh, residential, uh, also some non-residential uses that support agriculture. So here is where we would encourage uh, only very large lot size requirements or low density development uh, so that we don't uh, approve large scale subdivisions where there's working agricultural lands. Um, 
uh, in the agricultural area would also discourage some of those high impact land uses that might impact agriculture, uh, like uh, some heavy industrial uses, that sort of thing. Uh, there's also a rural residential category that allows some low density neighborhoods, um, larger lots than currently uh, allowed, uh, but some more flexibility there. Also a, a rural cluster option that would allow smaller lots in exchange for provision of open space and some other design criteria to make sure the new development fits in that rural area. Uh, and then in a uh, rural center area, which is kind of a commercial district, mostly small scale uses uh, in this area, and then an industrial district uh, that uh, allows for um, a larger scale, higher impact uses uh, if, if they meet performance standards in the HIDO. Uh, but a lot of those uses in that industrial district would require potentially a, uh, a special use permit. Um, so uh, as far as how we regulate use, there is going to be a uh, table of permitted uses. So in this table of permitted uses, we're going to have some uses that are permitted by right with that rezoning. Uh, and, and that's going to be that uh, if, it's, if, if an area is zoned a certain zoning district, then that, dis that use is permitted if they meet certain criteria. Uh, then, then a special use permit process where there's that extra level of approval that's needed. Uh, and then there's some uses that will be prohibited or some uses that won't be listed in here that will be permit prohibited in this part of the county. And in that a table of permitted uses, it will have a description and examples and, and other standards. This is just an example of, of a, a table of permitted uses. You see that it will have the zoning districts listed across the um, top and then P for, for if that use is permitted or if a special use permit is required for some subset of uses. Uh, and this is we're working uh, with staff on this and, and going back and forth and also going to be working with the steering committee to kind of uh, finalize kind of what the recommended uh, set of uh, assignments of either whether uses are permitted or, or special use permit is required. Uh, and then this is an example of looking at non-residential uses. So you can see that, you know, a lot of uh, the the non-residential uses are really going to be encouraged or, or allowed in that, that rural center district or the rural commercial district, uh, but in some other areas, like the rural residential or the agriculture, some of those commercial, uh, especially the, the larger scale commercial uses, uh, are going to, not going to be allowed and, and, and folks would have to petition for a rezoning in order to get in that rural commercial district. In each of these districts, we're also going to have uh, dimensional standards. Uh, so this can be as simple as a, a minimum lot size for a particular use or, or a maximum density in terms of dwelling units per acre for uh, a residential use, minimum lot width, um, and other relevant criteria, diagrams to, to, to help uh, folks understand what that means. Uh, there's al already some uh, dimensional criteria in the uh, the unified development ordinance, like setbacks and that sort of thing. We would be referencing those things that already exist where they do exist. Um, there will also uh, likely be some subdivision standards, particularly on the residential side, talking about access and lot design um, and, and streets and utilities and, and, and grading and, and that sort of thing that's particular to uh, some subdivision of, of land. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, kind of conventional development versus the rural cluster option. Uh, this is something that we talked about with the land development plan. And um, conventional subdivisions would be allowed uh, in the rural residential area. And there would be a minimum lot size requirement. What we are doing is providing an incentive for these rural clusters, uh, which are uh, uh, allowing smaller, smaller, narrower lots in exchange for uh, preservation of open space and, and, um, uh, and meeting certain design standards. So this is an example of kind of a conventional uh, subdivision on the left and then a rural cluster again could have some smaller lots but overall we would like to preserve some open space uh, and views from, from major roads and, and also be good neighbors to working agricultural areas. Uh, so not putting you know uh, backs of uh, 50 homes right up against uh, 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 a pasture, for instance, that would be an example of being a, a, a better neighbor. Um, you could be a better neighbor. Um, so the zoning map is going to be something that's really important. Uh, it's, it's, we, we craft the ordinance, but this, the map is really where those districts get to assign to individual properties. This is something that's going to take quite some time. We are working with uh, the GIS department and the planning department to to look at uh, 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 different different things to, to make sure that initial assignment is as as 
uh, appropriate as possible. Um, we're looking at the future land use map from the land development plan as one input. We're also looking at parcel size, existing parcel size, uh, also existing land uses. Um, one of the things the planning board really wanted us to do is make sure we acknowledge existing businesses in the study area. There's a number of businesses that exist in rural areas that are operating and have operated for quite some time, and, and we don't want to make them non-conforming uh, with the enaction of this ordinance. This is something that we want to acknowledge their presence, and, and they will probably get that rural center uh, designation. Um, also, working agricultural lands is something we're looking at. To give you an idea of, of parcel size, this is kind of a map that shows parcel size in the snow camp area. The darker uh, green uh, tracks are, 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 are properties over 50 acres. Uh, and then the uh, red um, smaller uh, parcels are, are those, those smaller uh, parcels. You can see some, some uh, rural residential subdivisions in there. And those, those clusters of red will likely get that rural <coughs> residential uh, zoning district. Uh, and then some of those larger properties are probably working agricultural land, so they might get the, the agricultural air, uh, district as well. Um, overall, uh, something that we want to do is make sure that new development is a little bit more appropriate and context sensitive in this area. Uh, right now, the current subdivision ordinance um, is, is um, uh, fairly uh, flexible in terms of lot size, uh, and you can have pretty small lots. Um, and uh, without a lot of <laughs> design criteria or, or, um, or things that, that kind of limit impacts on your neighbor, even if they are agricultural uh, operations. So um, something that we're looking at is, is probably increasing that minimum lot size or overall density of development. And uh, we'll be working through uh, exactly how to do that and have more information when we bring that back um, later on. So the next steps, uh, we have the, the board meeting uh, tonight. We have a steering committee uh, next week. Uh, looking forward a little bit to August, September, will be another steering committee meeting. Uh, the draft ordinance will likely uh, be ready for review in September, uh, and, and the public in input will begin then uh, with, with workshops, uh, probably a, a way to comment and provide some additional feedback you know, online or by mail. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a, a short overview of the process, but happy to answer any questions. I've got a couple questions. Oh, can you describe what a public workshop is, how it works, and where it'll be conducted? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this would be a time when we would have the opportunity to talk with folks uh, in, in the study area, uh, and landowners and property owners. Uh, and we would set up the meeting to where there's probably an overview of the process uh, and overview of the draft ordinance. And, and, and also a way for us to outline how we want feedback, how, you know, what are the questions that are still on the table because we're going to have a couple rounds of this uh, and a chance for people to, to hear a little information on the project but also ask questions about, uh, about the, the draft ordinance and about their property and, and give us feedback of, of, um, of where we think we're, we're heading in the right direction or things that we need to be thinking about um, along the way. So if I'm a citizen and I want to interact with a process about my property, the public workshop is the place to do it? Are there other places well, to there, do it? Well, there also be a, a couple other ways to do it. Um, and we haven't talked through all the particulars, but there's probably some sort of online comment form and potentially a mailing, a mailer to um, property owners. And that's something that we did, yeah, we did, we did talk about, and that would be another way for folks to be aware of the process, but also provide specific feedback. Yeah, I think as many ways as the public can provide feedback about their particular parcels is, is yeah. advisable. Yeah. We did post it last time we posted it. It's on the general store and everything down there. That got great feedback, too. So things that we did well through the land development plan, we plan on doing that and any additional things through this process as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, the last step in implementation, it could be that you notify property owners in some form or fashion as well. Uh, so it's it's kind of like multiple stages of involvement, um, and you know whether uh, you know what happens when. But they providing multiple avenues for for comment and feedback. Uh, if folks want to discuss things or have more information, want some 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 ask some questions, then there'll be ways to do that. Will be in person ways to do that, online uh, ways to do that as well. Uh, and you know it. it 
uh, we're open to suggestions and, and as far as location goes I think there's a number of, of, of good options uh, down in snow camp um, and we'd be you know, working that out with staff the last question uh, talking when you're talking about existing use I think you said the intent is that there's an existing use that the use would be allowed to continue for the most part yes uh, I mean I don't know I don't want to say that as a blanket statement but for the most part yes and especially commercial use is that something that we want to acknowledge uh, in the assignment of the existing zoning um, but then there's also a number of like home based businesses things right. like that that um, uh, are, are appropriate and, and are in the draft ordinance were specifically addressing addressing that and putting some boundaries on it and, and, and um, you know uh, making sure that you know, there's a there's a clear demarcation it what happens if it expands or becomes a you know principal use that that sort of thing but that's something that we're trying to, to anticipate and if the current use doesn't meet setback requirements that are going to be in the new ordinance if we get if we get that far that yeah what will, will, will those be allowed as well yes yes I and, and that's how we write the ordinance we want it to be a pretty flexible ordinance uh, given the, the fact given the fact that there's um, you know some of the setbacks that were established in snow camp there's structures that predate right. that ordinance right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's something that adds to the rural character right. you know um, you know some historic buildings are going to be non-conforming and that's okay uh, and, and that's not something that we're trying to, to prevent what we're trying to prevent is is future development making sure that future development is kind of in line with the existing character uh, so everything so, be grandfathered in. That's what you're saying. Yeah, a lot, a lot of things. There's different ways to do that. Like setbacks, for instance, that that it's okay to have non-conforming structures and setbacks, and you can re, rebuild the structure in, if, if something happens. Uh, same thing with lot size. If we have a lot size that is one acre, and there's a there's a property that is you know 32,000 square foot, um, you know that's going to be grandfathered in, and they will be able to you know rebuild that home if something happens uh, and also you know at, I think we're writing into where they can add an addition as long as they don't go, you know go into the setbacks uh, they can do that uh, so that's what I mean by flexible ordinance it's yeah. it's it's not something that's you know it's not going to be an ordinance that's in downtown Chapel Hill right like this is it needs to be flexible it's a rural area uh, and, and, and it needs to be flexible so the mechanic who's had a garage at his house forever out in snow camp is fine mm -hmm. or yeah. the chick has got a beauty shop in her house yeah it's fine yeah well, what like happens it. if the garage burns down <laughs> are they going to have to then conform to the new regulations? no they, they we i think we're writing it to where they can they can rebuild that yeah. well having served on the board during the period of the snow camp mine i won't call it i just during the period of dealing with snow camp mine i can guarantee you we want or at least I want, I think everybody on this board wants our citizens to have every opportunity possible to have input into the final plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we want our citizens to come out of this thinking this is their plan. It's not our plan. Uh, yep. This is their plan. That's right. Board, any other questions? We thank you. No problem. Thanks Definitely. for having me. And Tanya, I think you have the next item as well. I just well. thought I'd hang out for a little while, I'll be honest. See what you're up to tonight. You know? um, your next item for planning is the application for heavy industrial development. It's a inert debris landfill. Is an existing landfill down on Kimesville Road. It's the Philippi Inert Debris Landfill. You have a staff sheet in there, but let me give you just a little bit of background. Um, this application is actually for a phase two. They got their phase one approval in 2015, and that was 1.99 acres. The request for phase two, which we're looking at tonight, is for the expansion, same use, but expansion on the same piece of property. Property is a little over 21 acres, so it meets our minimums and the addition is just under five acres is what they're looking for this actually came in in our 2011 hido we've had a few revisions since then so the udo part section that has hido in it this doesn't necessarily conform to that because it doesn't have to 
but what you've got before you, and y'all have got the site plan in your packet too, but you've got the write-up. And this again is on Constable Road. It's um, pin number 885-1173-781. If anybody's watching uh, YouTube wanting to look that up. Uh, you've got the site plan and you've got the application from Mr. and Mrs. Filthy on the property. This did get approved at planning board uh, last yeah, last week. So they or two weeks ago, I guess. They gave um, unanimous vote for approval. Since this is just an expansion of existing use. It is something to be considered, but it's not like a brand new heavy industrial use coming in. We did have one question come in about traffic and what we understand and owner is here and he can offer whatever. And the, what we understand is the traffic's not looking to increase. What we're actually looking for and expect out there is that he's going to need to close the existing part of the landfill because he's full and he's needing to expand to continue his business, not to make more business, just to continue what he's got. So those, that's what we understand from that use. But this needs your vote tonight, or your vote whether it is tonight or not, in order for this to be approved. Once it is approved, it will get an intent to construct permit. They will actually do what the site plan says, and they'll come back to us for an authorization to operate and that's standard from all our um, heavy industrial development ordinances so it's a two-step process they won't come back to you for that second piece that will just be a staff um, visit and do a site inspection to get their stuff Ms. Cato, what is inert debris <laughs> so the major contract that he's got is for he picks up the um, tree limbs and things from burlington options like that and brings them to the landfill and dumps them. You didn't grow up in the country, did you? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I know. I'm just that's what everybody else does. <laughs> sure, like stumps and, and just stuff like that. Right. Heavy stuff that nobody knows what to do with. You don't take it down right. to Richard Hill. No. Mm, different group. Do any, no does anybody problem. complain about the traffic in and out of that with these big trucks? We've not heard anything. He's like I said, he's been there there since 2015. We never had a violation. We never had a concern. We've never heard from anybody awesome. about that. We don't have any records of anybody having a concern. So mm -hmm. uh, the question came just when this they have to actually post the property and put it in the newspaper and send mailings to adjacent owners, which is includes us across the street. Streets don't exist when we say adjacent. So all that had to be done. And we got the one comment. Awesome. Motion to approve. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Did everybody vote? <laughs> Maybe you can go down there on a little field trip and check that out. We've done that before. Yeah. The well, landfill is fascinating. <laughs> and Mr. Ingram, uh, see you still sitting here. You're welcome to continue joining us, but if you want to leave, we're not going to. Uh, <laughs> we won't talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> well. I got, a, I got a big, uh, big date tomorrow, so I appreciate that. Yes, and you've got a long drive. Is the reason I made the comment. Thank but, you for your time. Well, thank you. We're your new best friends. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to stay that way. <laughs> Mr. Johnson. Yes, sir. Good evening, commissioners. I'm appearing before you tonight to ask you to help the Alamance County Sheriff's Department institute a compensation package for our deputies uh, ranging from sergeant all the way up to major y'all have heard me come before you many times and previous commissioners has too to talk about how inadequate our salaries are compared to the other law enforcement agencies in this county i'm asking you tonight to let me take from our unspent funds salary funds from our detention center for the year 2021, use 550,000 of that to bring our officers up to the level that the rest are close to the level that the agencies in this county is at this time. I assure you, my officers work harder than any agencies in this county. If you don't believe it, we'll put you in a car and let you see. <laughs> uh, and I'm asking you, please allow me to do this for my people. They earned it. The, the way I understand it, too, the driver behind this was the fact that there was some erroneous information mm -hmm. on how much was allowable to give an increase it, when, a, when an officer exactly. was being promoted 
to sergeant, from sergeant to lieutenant, from lieutenant to captain, and so forth. Back and when I become sheriff, uh, Mr. Carter, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we were told by, at that time, I think David Cheek was the, you can only give four and a half percent from one step, like sergeant to lieutenant, and that was totally erroneous. And thanks to the finance department and uh, talking with them, we found out that was totally incorrect. And for that reason, it's the reason the Alamance County uh, Sheriff's Office officers are so, were so far behind the other right. agencies. I'm asking you tonight, please help me make this up. This money to approve. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you all yeah. on behalf of all the deputies of the Alamance thank County Sheriff's Office. Thank you for what thank all you guys do. Thank you so much. And we thank you and all of you guys. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, Ms. Hook. Good evening. Um, I am bringing before you guys. Oh, congratulations. Oh, there was no salary increase for your. <laughs> your then don't congratulate <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm bringing before you guys a request to enter into a contract with a new employee health care clinic. So I'm going to, and I have never used this before. Let's hope it works. Look, it does. Okay, so what I want to do is just give you a little bit of history on our health care clinic and the purpose of it. We have had a health care, an employee health cl uh, care clinic since 2010. Um, it's an avenue to provide urgent care and acute care and preventative health services to employees. If you'll remember that the county is self-insured, so that means that any time an employee goes to the doctor, the insurance looks like it pays, and it does, but then it asks the county to pay them back. So we're basically paying for any doctor's visits that they make. Through an employee clinic, we pay a set amount, and the employee can go as many times as they want. So it's either the county pays it through the clinic, or, they can't, or the county pays it through individual visits. The thought on this is that if we provide that clinic to the employees, it gives them easy access because that clinic is dedicated just to Alamance County employees. They can get in and out and get back to work quickly. It also motivates the employees to seek medical care and address issues before they become catastrophic. So if you've got a place that you can go, you can get in easily. You're might, mo more likely to go for little things that you might would put off if you've got to get an appointment with your primary care physician and it takes a month to get into. So that's really what this is about. Um, it does encourage employees to go because um, it's not costing any more for them to go. And in right. the long run, it does help the county. Over the time that we have had a clinic in place, we have had employees that have been um, identified with very serious conditions that were caught very early. So there is um, a, a lot of opportunity for savings in this. So we've been with the same provider for uh, since 2010 and we changed our insurance broker last year and during that transition, or it may have been a year and a half ago, during that transition, we looked at the clinic and decided it was time to look at proposals for other clinic services or service providers. So USI, who is our insurance broker, sent RFQs on behalf of the county. Um, we received five proposals, and this was actually in March of last year. So we were doing this right before COVID hit, and that kind of put the brakes on everything. Um, they, the five uh, companies made presentations to a committee that was made up of USI, county staff, and the county manager. We narrowed it down to three providers. We asked more and more questions and asked for more presentations. In the last presentation, um, Commissioner Paisley was in that one as well, and we made the decision to go with Everside Health. Um, Everside Health. And so, what I'm bringing to you is an opportunity um, or the request to go with Everside Health or, or sign that contract. 
I have some backup people with me if you guys have any questions. Um, I have David Young from Everside. I've got Linda Klein from USI and then Cheryl Ray who is the Assistant um, Human Resources Director and Cheryl has worked very closely with both of them on this proposal. So a little bit about Everside and if you have questions then David can answer any of those. It is a national company and it focuses on employee health clinics. That is their business and they're very good at what they do. They have 350 health centers in 35 states. 46 of those health centers are located in North Carolina. So these are private health centers that are either for, public, uh, for private companies or for public entities like us. Um, Alamance County is going to be served out of their Charlotte office, so we will have a local contact. And Everside has worked with Durham County for more than 10 years. And we did have discussions with them, and they have been very pleased with um, the service that they've received from Everside, obviously, since they've been with them for 10 years. So let me just talk a little bit about what our current services look like and what some of the expanded services look like. So currently in our healthcare clinic, um, employees are able to get annual physicals. They're able to get acute care, which is going to be your sinus infections, ear infections, colds, that kind of thing. Um, they will be able to get, they can get lab draws and processing. So if they need to um, get like their cholesterol checked and those things for their annual physical, they can get that done at our employee clinic. And they're able to, the clinic is able to see dependents age 18 and over that are on our employee health plan. With Everside, they can expand those services and they're able to see kid, uh, dependents ages two and up. Now they would not be their primary um, pediatrician, but they are able to offer services to them. They also have telemedicine cap uh, capability, disease management capability. Um, they will communicate and send out communications to employees trying to boost engagement. And they will also do pre-employment drug screening for us. That is not currently done in our employee health clinic. That is currently done in the occupational health clinic at Cone, and we are charged a per uh, per visit fee for that. So that will give us a little bit of savings as well. And they have the ability to refer to any network. So what that means is that they have the ability to look at our Cigna network and work with an employee to say, okay, you need to go and get an MRI. Let's look at the places that you can go and get an MRI and let's see what are some of the less expensive options not looking at not trying to get bad quality but trying to find places like if they were to go to an outpatient center to get that instead of having that in the hospital there would be some savings there that's a savings for the county but it's also a savings for the employee because once they leave the clinic and they go see another doctor then they're using their insurance and they're subject to deductible and copay so if we can find them a little bit less alter uh, um, alternative, then it's going to save them money as well. Um, and then also Everside is very, um, they have clinic reporting, integration with Cigna, which I already talked about, and then biometric aggregate reporting, which basically that is, if, if we will, what we will do is we will um, encourage employees to go there to get their blood work done. If they do, then the company is going to keep the results and they will aggregate those results. We will never see any individual's results, but they will aggregate and they'll let us know like, you know, 20% of your population has, um, needs to be looking at their cholesterol. 20% needs to be looking at this or whatever. And they will help us design wellness programs around that. And when I talk about um, in, uh, engagement, that's what I'm talking about is they will, put together programs that specifically target those things, trying to help the employee get healthier. Although we all know the employee takes a big responsibility, but we're going to put the information out there. Um, as far as staffing, it will look a little bit different, but I don't think it'll be apparent to the employees. Right now we have 36 hours with a nurse practitioner and 40 hours with a CMA. 
In our new model, it would be 20 hours with a nurse practitioner and 40 hours with a registered nurse. And then we get to the biggest piece, which is going to be about the cost. And so what you see is that from our current provider, the, uh, they did give us a contract, uh, a proposal as well. And these costs are coming off of their proposal. So the first year contract out of their proposal is $462,917. Uh, $462, and um, that does include an estimate of lab supplies, rent of $87,000. That's subject to change based on how much utilization. The first year cost with Everside is going to be 456908 and the lab supplies rent is estimated a little bit lower, but there is a one-time build-out cost of 75000 and that is they will go and rent space, but they will need to up, upfit that space so that it will be, look like a clinic and function as a clinic. With our current provider, the second year contract has a 3% inflation increase, which takes it to 476804 and with Everside, their second year cost does have an inflation increase, but because the one-time build-out of 75000 is reduced or taken <laughs> off of it, their second year costs are 393 six, uh, $365. So you'll see that what we're looking at is we feel like this will be better engagement with the employee, and it's at a reduced cost. And then some of the other things that I wanted to point out that did make um, Everside a little bit different um, is, um, you know, they're, uh, uh, they're going to focus on wellness, condition management. They're going to support employees through their health issues. They do have engagement strategies, a collaborative approach. I've already talked about that. They do have a nice reporting platform. I already talked about that. But the one thing that does make them very different is that they offer a performance guarantee. And so we will sit with them and we will decide what those things we want to see out of them for the upcoming year are going to be. Um, patient satisfaction, reporting, health, health improvements. And they um, are offering that at risk. So if they don't meet our ROI or our expectations, then um, they're putting up their management fee against that. So that does make them very different from some of the others that we looked at. So this, um, this is already budgeted in the budget in the health care or health insurance fund. But what I'm asking is that the board allow us to enter into a contract, move from our current provider, um, and enter into a contract with Everside. And this is a five-year contract, is that correct? This is a one-year contract. All right. One-year contract. We um, would hope to keep renewing it. Well, I see in, uh, on page two under term, uh, talks about a five-year initial term. That's what I read. Do we need to look at that? That's what I read as well. Uh, Clyde, Clyde's already reviewed the contract and offered verbiage for that, so it's in there. So it's, it's, at your, it's at the pleasure of the board every year yes. on budget renewal. All right, so Mr. Albright, you'll, you'll modify that. So the contract that you have in here is one that we are still working through with Clyde. We just wanted to get it in front of you. So that is our intent that it is a year to year. And what you've got is the draft. Clyde is still going back and forth it's with It's only him. as good as the budget. If you budget for it, then it's paid. If you don't budget for it, then we find another provider. So they won't go up every year, surprise? Well, they will. They'll do an inflation rate, and it's got, right now it's at 3%. Okay. And when you but say, it won't be like Yeah, when you 100%. say they go there, where's there? Where's there so at we've right not, now? Uh, right now, it, with, it is with Cone Health. Okay. Is there going to be there? No. <laughs> so there will be a new spot for this. It has not been located yet. So um, Everside is looking for a, play, a facility right now, and we're not sure where that's going to be. So. Okay, if, if we get them and, and they get $75,000 to remodel this place and then we decide that this decision won't happen, we eat that $75,000? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yes, that is the downside. 
but we're looking at a, at least a one year <coughs> regardless. So um, having looked at what we have with Cone and um, and what Everside is providing and having met with those folks, I'd move that we approve this plan but make sure that it is a year-to-year -year plan, Mr. Albright. I'll second that. Yeah, that's the only thing I'd want to make sure. Because I just, I'd noticed that as well, that it was in, it's one year, we're good to go. Did we have, we didn't have a $75,000 do anything with the one we got right now, because they're at the hospital, right? We did not. But I understand in my conversation earlier with uh, Mr. Haygood that the space may no longer be available over a cone for the facility. Is that correct? That's my understanding. They they have re they have uh, moved us out of our space. Um, there were some issues during COVID. They moved us out of our space into the main hospital, and they have not indicated that they would move us back into that space. I think uh, we're a we will be able to continue to have the clinic with cone on a month to month basis until uh, the clinic with Everside becomes operational. And we think that will take about 120 days. And do we do the upfit? The 75,000 or do they? No, I'm about be, the money. I'm talking about the actual nail and hammer kind of stuff. Do, I believe that's It's on part there. of the contract. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's part of the um, fees that I have. It's part of this uh, 456,000. So do our, our, our employees, when they use this service, will they have the ability like we have with other services to get um, uh, updates? We have a program, my chart, update yeah, from your doctors and so forth. You'll yes, have sir. the ability to do that. Yes, sir. Totally. They'll have an app on their phone or a computer, a laptop, anything that they want to use. They could, they'll get their labs. They'll be able to text their provider. They'll be able to reorder the medication schedule appointments schedule appointments yes you, you named the obvious one thank you just out of curiosity with the school system they had a contract with armc that provided counseling the teacher had a death in the family or, or any kind of situation like that is that part of that counseling we would not have a professional counselor we we have a separate contract with armc okay. in their um eap program okay. their counseling yeah two questions mr. chairman if, if we approve this when is it uh, effective I think it becomes effective once the um, if I read I, think I was just reading that about the terms it says once the facility opens it's it's going to take them some time to find the facility and then upfit it so I was looking on page two 120 days the estimate. Well, that's the estimate, assuming we can find space. So the term of the agreement will commence upon the opening of the first health center uh, to when it opens up, I guess, uh, 100, 120 days. We so hope 120 days. How much space do you in? Oh, excuse me. What, what are we doing in the meantime? So our current facility has uh, allowed us to go to a month-to-month -month contract. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, are we, we, our contract is in draft form at this point? It so, is. So our action tonight is we're not really we're not approving the contract not the contract you, I'm asking that you give us the permission to go with Everside okay to move from our current uh, current provider to Everside and that would allow the chair to um, sign the contract I've given you the cost so he would sign the contract when it's approved we can share that contract with the board if you'd like okay I'd, when it's finalized I would like for the board to see the contract mm -hmm. Yeah. and make sure that you guys don't have questions right. about it uh, Mr. we Chairman, just want to get moving that's sure. really yeah I understood your motion to be approval of the contract but I, th I, I think and I need to amend that just yeah. one more question if you find a building and we give you the 75 to remodel it do you pay the rent or do we pay the rent on the building that's not ours so we pay the rent and it's um, as part of the uh, as part of those overall costs I've just factored it in there okay mm -hmm. Do you so know how much it, space you need? I think it's about 1500 to 1500 2000 to 2000 1800 probably perfect. Well, there's plenty of space like that available. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So my question would be, between you and Mr. Albright, how soon will we have a contract? <laughs> Pretty soon. I'm fast. I think we're very close to being done with the contract. It's been back and forth a few times in a draft format. You think we'll have that by August 2nd? Yes, sir. 
Mr. Albright. <clears throat> and I think you've got a green light uh, okay. if if uh, we have a contract August 2nd and uh, oh, we'll, we'll have a contract before August 2nd. <laughs> All right. And I want this board to see it so that I don't sign something this board does not approve. Is this something like it can be in a strip mall? Just a standard store with that kind of we have them in strip balls, we have them in office buildings, okay. we have them in standalone spaces. Gotcha. Okay. All right. We have a motion on the floor. It's not to approve the contract at this point, it's to approve the concept to go um, with these folks. And I've, everything I've seen is very, very positive. I uh, appreciate all the time you put into it and the willingness to talk to us. Um, so I would say, uh, let's approve Everside Health subject to the final signing of the contract on or about August 2nd. You want to have to second. second that? I think, I think Mr. Turner's already seconded it, but oh, I'll, no. I'll second it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, we're not going to fight over seconds. No. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, Ward? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, again, thank you. You know how much. Thank you. Thank you. Look much. forward to working with you. Thank you. <coughs> but get us a contract. Mr. Hager, would you approach a second? Certainly. This was on my desk. This is something we're doing something about. This was the city of Graham, we're moving Frank Oh, yeah, okay, we just yeah. need to sign it down. And uh, make it from Eric Hall. Uh, to right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. He's a little confused on the defendant. Okay, um, Ms. Hager. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Um, an item for your consideration tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about the Medicap facility. Uh, I'm sure the commissioners are familiar with Medicap. This is the former uh, pharmacy and other business facility located at 378 Hardin Street in Burlington. We've got information in your packet about this facility. Uh, the building was constructed in 2006. Total square footage is approximately 10,600 square feet. There are three suites to the building, A, B, and C. A is the main space where the pharmacy was located. It's a little over 7,100 square feet in the suite A space. Suite B and C, those are both storage spaces at this time. I think they were businesses at one time. We're using them as storage now. Uh, suite B is a little over 1,700 square feet, and Suite C, a little over 1,500 square feet. The property has 56 parking spaces. Currently, four are marked uh, uh, for disabled parking. Property also has drive through lanes and a drive through window that the pharmacy used when it was in operation. So the county currently leases all three suites at Medicap, suites B and C are currently leased for Board of Election <coughs> storage. So uh, Kathy Holland has equipment stored in multiple locations, Turntine Street, several uh, private uh, storage facilities, and both B and C suites at uh, Medicap. The monthly lease cost for the B and C suites together is $3,890.11 per month. And the leases, it's one lease for those two suites expires on October 31st of this year. And the county also has suite A, which is the pharmacy space leased. We leased this space for tax, for the tax department during the COVID epidemic, uh, the height of COVID. I'm sure you'll all remember uh, it was attractive to the tax department because of the drive through window, kept a lot of folks out of this, uh, this space, did it for social distancing purposes. The Suite A monthly lease cost is $6,092.50 per month. That's the current lease cost. It does expire July 31st of this month, and that's why we're here tonight. Uh, the total current lease of all the Medicap space is just shy of $10,000, $9,982.61 per month for all three suites. So as we have reached the end of the lease for tax purposes uh, of the Medicap Suite A, uh, we've put together some thoughts about what could the future of this Medicap facility be. We've put together a floor plan that's in your packet that uh, reflects how this property could work for the Board of Elections. 
it would require renovations to the space. So when you look at that floor plan, that's that's work inside the building, moving walls, uh, redoing some office spaces. The floor plan that's in the packet accommodates all of the Board of Elections staff. It accommodates their training space needs. It ac uh, accommodates their operational space. As you can imagine, the Board of Elections, has, uh, as people have, uh, voter turnout has gone through the roof. They have a lot of folks that they now train uh, an outfit and need for uh, storage for their voting equipment. The Medicap facility meets most of the Board of Elections storage needs. Uh, I think we've talked about there is some equipment, uh, sneeze guards and uh, parts of the voting booths that are not needed to be stored in like confidential secured areas that we might would look at. I think Kathy would look at another alternative. We've talked about this property has enough room on it, particularly in the rear, that we may be, if we were to proceed with acquiring this property, it might be feasible to consider putting some kind of a metal building or something else on the property to put those particular not so sensitive pieces of election equipment in. But in the floor plan, it accommodates the rest of the Board of Election storage needs. We did have a, an assessment done of the building in December of 2019. Uh, and that, that has been included in the packet also, where we had uh, some uh, uh, building engineers and electrical engineers and folks go through the building and take a look at it, try to give us an idea of what its status was at that time. As you can see from the report, there are minor repairs needed to the building. I think the, the major, um, besides the renovation work that would be needed to be done inside to make, make the building accommodate the Board of Elections, uh, the HVAC units are original to the construction, so that means they're about 15 years old. They're probably ending the nearing the end of their life. So we would consider um, they would need to be replaced. You can see the proposed floor plan. I don't know how to work the pointer, but if you look on the two, the, on the right, those two similarly sized, uh, the right there is Bruce is hovering over them. Those are suites B and C that and are laid out based on Kathy's dimensions of storage for election uh, machinery. And it also provides some space in there for her folk to store equipment as well as uh, if they do ballot counting and they have other functions like that during the course of the election it could take place in that space everything else on the other side where bruce is hovering the um the cursor is suite a that's the pharmacy space about seven thousand square feet that is office training space uh ballot rooms uh, uh i think the board of elections would actually uh, have space where they would also meet in this building so you can you can look at this at your leisure this is this is not necessarily the final plan for the building I'm sure it would be tweaked as uh, if we go forward with acquiring the property. Um, so our capital plan, the county's capital plan, accommodates acquiring this facility and renovating it with a mixed use of our capital reserves and some debt. Uh, we're going to be coming back to the board soon. We have a bid out right now for the HVAC work over at the Human Services Center on Graham Hopedale Road. And in our capital plan, we uh, believe the capital plan shows debt being issued for the HVAC project and a portion of uh, uh, the Medicap project in fall of 2021. Here. I apologize. Uh, the HVAC for that uh, property, I know the temporary unit went out. It Has did. that been resolved? Yes, it, it was. It took, uh, well, we had to, I believe we had to close DSS for one day. Uh, it took a, uh, we tried to use the generator from emergency management, but that would not marry up to it. I think Joel is here. He might be able to speak to. Uh, it was. It was eventually solved. It, we got it solved in time to get DSS had to get back. The new transformer from Charlotte trucked up, and, and that's what took so long to get it here installed. Uh, the emergency management generator was too small, and we looked at renting additional sizes, but we just couldn't get it here in time. So, uh, but it was at about I think two days of downtime total. Um, but it was resolved and back up and running. So the temporary generator is up, or the, I'm sorry, the chiller is running at this point. So when will our final unit be installed? Uh, it should wow. be in the next couple of months, I believe. Yes, it took, that, that uh, was a quite a long process to order it and uh, get it delivered and then have it installed. So I think the next month or so it should be in. Um, and I think the health department was able to continue to function. I don't think uh, they were. We had portable units for them, so we were able to maintain the vaccine center and some of the other areas temporarily. So suffice it to say that our, our capital plan shows us using some capital reserves and consolidating uh, uh, an installment loan with the HVAC project and part of the Medicap project if the board 
decides to go forward with that. We do believe it would be possible to use ARP funds to renovate Medicap uh, because this is being done for elections so, and, and primarily to socially distance the Board of Elections staff and the folks that come in and out of the right. building for uh, voter registration or for our uh, training purposes for our election workers and because it will involve HVAC replacement and renovations, not just the units. It will also involve reconfiguring the space because we'll be, if, if we go in, change the way the space is laid out, we'll be doing duct work. So we'll be talking about the possibility of using ARP funds for this project on um, August 2nd. That's a lot more pu public parking for it too, isn't it? Right yes, now, right now the Board of Elections, I don't remember how many spaces they have, but it's it's not many. Like six. Yeah. It is, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, talking with Kathy, you know, uh, the Board of Elections, I mean, the Medicap property would be better also for the, um, you know, when they end the election and they have all the precinct officials coming in. If you've worked that, you've seen it's a exciting time here at the corner uh, when you're having all those folks coming back. I think th this property would be, would be much more conducive to, to that type of work. Well, it shuts Graham down <laughs> when yes. they're coming in out of the shop. Do you have any idea how much um, you're talking about using, like, ARPA funds? Do you have any, any kind of idea what kind of money you're talking Our about? Our estimate was $750,000 to renovate the property, so uh, to go that in. included the HVAC systems? I believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. And the cost of acquisition? Well, I was hesitant to talk about that because tonight I, I, I would like to ask for the board to consider, would you like for us to ne begin negotiations with the property owner? I think uh, we, we have some estimates of what the value uh, of the property is worth. I think, uh, I guess it's okay to mention that, that estimated value. Does that, is there any, I don't if know if you there's have any. Well, well, that was probably a bad question. Well, if, if the perspective of negotiating is uh, a horrible question. Yeah, we'll not, withdraw that question. I, I, so I, what we're asking for this evening is if the commissioners see value in, in continuing to use Medi-Cal, then we would like to ask the board for permission to begin negotiations for purchase, right? We would approach the owners and start uh, working on what could we acquire the building for. In the meantime, we would also ask the board, there's a suite, um, excuse me, a lease in the package uh, that is a month-to-month -month lease for this property. So we know that the um, suite B and C expire in October of this year, the goal would be to try to negotiate a purchase, come back to the board, give the board insight as to how much the property owner wants for it, what does that mean for our capital plan. So we don't have an idea of how much he wants for it? Not how much they want. We, we have, have some, a general idea how much they want for it. We have a, Over a million dollars. Yes. Yes. A million plus 750000 is what? We can don't I, need this building, folks. Can I ask another question, too? You're, you're saying that you probably are going to probably have to add a metal building on the back of it which is like storage unit business it's almost ironic but the thing of it is is this is a really nice business building and it sounds like it's going to be used a lot of it for storage yes do we not have a piece of land somewhere that we could build a metal building that could do all of this and it would be ours I'm just asking because I know when we were leasing some other big place, putting tractors and dump trucks, and, and don't quote me because Buddy will probably have a hot <laughs> fit me calling his instruments wrong, but um, I don't want to offend him. But I mean, it's like, I mean, it's just like lease. It's just like, it's just nothing to it. I mean, I, I just think, can we not build something of our own for whatever this big amount of money is and it's ours? I mean, I want a nice place for Board of Elections. That is, that's a big, big deal. But when I hear about all this storage that's going into this really modern business suites, I thought, heck, Sweet C could do the ever whatever that you was talking about a while ago for the health thing. I, I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. I'm not a contractor, thus for Deg, I'm sure. But I, it just seems like we buy these buildings. I mean, I am not going to dare beat up on the school board <laughs> for thinking about BB and T and releasing that big money for the month plus remodeling that and that was just a thinking out loud kind of situation mm -hmm. and it seems like we're kind of maybe doing the same thing i just would rather us i mean i don't know what our land is where your little land file is but i'm just curious if there's anywhere we've got that we could actually build something a metal building to do it all i mean we just seem to have one spot, one spot. And I know it needs to be under one roof, but if it's not big enough to do it right now, I can't see spending this kind of money and adding on to it already. That's 
that's just me thinking out loud. Just be thinking out loud. Well, that's why we're here this evening is to say we're nearing the end of the lease. There is value from the Board of Elections perspective of having their offices, their training space, and all their storage together. Right? Absolutely. Um, and again, what we understand from Kathy, this building will not hold everything that, that she needs to store. That's our understanding. So that would be something we'd have to address. That we'd have to figure out a way to store, I think it's uh, sneeze guards and some other type of... Uh, how much how much can be saved on the stuff that we're storing in places that can be moved into here? There would be some we're savings. We're space I, to store equipment now. Off the top of my head, I, I don't know how much that's costing. I think uh, the Turrentine Street location, we don't pay anything for. Uh, that's that's uh, it used to, It's a Ralph Scott facility, right. which I think I, we should be looking to get out of that facility. That's their um, uh, Star Point, their daytime program uh, activity for folks with uh, uh, disabilities. They did graciously allow us to move in there a couple of years ago, so the Board of Elections has stuff in there. But it, it would be reasonable to think about moving somewhere else. In the long run, it would be ideal to have the Board of Elections staff and all their operations plus their storage in one building. Absolutely. The, Let me the say one thing on that. Served on the Board of Elections for, what, 16 years. Um, they have a lot of very, very, very sensitive equipment, computers, extremely valuable and you have to keep those maintained in a prop properly maintained even climate wise right. facility it can't just go in a tin building or a whatever uh, because of security because of the um, temperature controls because mm -hmm. of all kinds of things and because we have to preserve those records um, i think we need to have the board of elections in one facility so that right now we're scattered all over the county. We have rental facilities in how many places for the Board of Elections only? I know we have uh, Turrentine, Turrentine Street and the Medicap Suites, and I think perhaps two more. Uh, two other rental. So we're storing there. The, so how many totally? Counting the Board of Elections. I believe it's four. Facility. Four Medicap, Turrentine, and two self storage. Two self storage, that's correct. Plus the Board of Elections building. That's correct. Yes. So you actually have five facilities we're using currently hmm. Do you how know? many of those are really secure they are all secure <laughs> absolutely they are yeah, they, it's, they, it's, they're, a question, it's a question that Craig Turner does not want me to ask <laughs> because we know that some of that is not where we want it to be facility wise temperature wise uh, all kinds of issues um, guys I think we at least, at least need to look at what, a, what this facility will cost, cost us very, very little to determine the numbers. Look at the, uh, look at the numbers, what's it gonna cost versus building the building that, that Ms. Thompson is talking about. But keep in mind with the Board of Elections, you can't stick it out in snow camp or somewhere just, you know, the voters have to have access to that facility. Uh, we should have bought them all. I think we need to Hill look at, look at the numbers. Too late. It's not and, too late. And not <laughs> cut off our heads at this point because we get excited. I just have, I just have one, one question just to go with what you're saying. You had four or five different buildings. If you had to give an estimate, what what's the total amount of square footage in those five, four, four or five facilities? If you had to, you don't have to hold me to it. I, hold, I won't hold you to it. I'm just trying to get an idea. I'll say, is, this one's 10,000. Is the other one, if, are they each 10,000 or are there maybe? No, I think, uh, so B and C are primarily storage, correct, Joel? That's correct. Mm -hmm. So you've got maybe 3,000, 3,200. Yeah, I'm talking about the total, the all, that we're using all, now. All buildings that you have, mm -hmm. all, I just, Trying to get an idea. This one's ten thousand six hundred. What, what's the total so of all sure five? Of the size of is it forty? Would you uh, say it would be less than thirty thousand or more? Yeah, than 30, no, 000? less, significantly less. less. Okay, so it's a little bit about the size. I, I guess I'm trying to get an idea. Uh, Eric Lane, like we had in the health department, is it? Do you think that's that much space all combined? So the the board of elections office space currently is about. 3,800 square feet. Most of that is office. There's probably, a Joel, rough yeah. estimate, maybe 800 square feet of storage. So there's about 800 square feet of straight storage at the Board of Elections. 3,200 here, so that's about 4,000 square feet of storage. Ralph Scott, 
if I had to just guess, mm -hmm. uh, Ralph right. Scott might be uh, two to three thousand square feet. Joe, would you think that's a fair estimate? Okay. So you might be sixty-five hundred to seven thousand square feet of pure storage. Just pure storage. Yes. Um, and they're currently in, in that case, maybe three thousand square feet of. Uh, Office space. Office space at the current Board of Elections. Which is extremely, it's just not anywhere what they need. I mean, no, they're, they're right. sitting on top of each other in the current location. Um, I mean, it's just our elections, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be real. Um, um, we've got to do something that will service our elections. Uh, this building may not be it, but if we don't look at it, we won't know. Well, I think, I think, uh, Mr. Lashley made an interesting suggestion. We just paid to renovate space over on Eric Lane for the health department, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how much uh, how much that would work. But I, and that's larger space. This sounds like you might need around fifteen to sixteen, maybe eighteen thousand square feet. That's I think thirty. Is that right? It is. I think so, this this ten thousand six hundred square feet will get everything in it, according to Kathy, except the. Um, sneeze guards which the were part of the booths. and the voting booths, voting booths. so 10,000 to 12,000 square feet is probably all that that the board of election needs with every I mean total out um, can we buy that facility well right now you know if you take it I everybody I'm t everybody I'm seeing and talking to out there in the marketplace saying that renting space is when is $200 a square foot $20. Wow. Mm. When, you know, the place that uh, the Holly Hill Mall over there, uh, we were talking at the ABSS meeting that it's 5,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And they're renting it for almost $6,000 a month. And that's, a, that's mm -hmm. a deal. He's yeah. actually giving us a deal. So the rental values are much, much higher. Much higher. But do you really need to spend one and three quarters million dollars for 10,000 square foot of space? Seems like, like a lot. Seems like it? very excessive. Uh, but then again, you know, now that we got, I'll dive in and start looking at it. Start you know, now they know ten to thou, ten to twelve thousand square foot. You go out there and play around, see what's going on. So, Mr. Haygood, what are you going to then ask for a month to month until we can find the space? So we're and not using authorize uh, this board authorize you to look for a space, I not think necessarily that particular space. Mm -hmm. So the B and C. Suites are full of election equipment now, and we and they're good till the end of October. Okay. And we do need to continue to use those, even if we if we don't have another solution by the end of October. I would be recommending to you to renew those yeah. because they are outfitted with all security, all climate control. They are working very well, uh, and until we have an option that does the same thing, we need those. There is no county function currently happening in Suite A, All right? So th there's no tax department taxes fully back here. If we were leasing, if we were to go month to month, it's because we want to acquire it and we're going to start uh, new property negotiation. So if the, if the commissioners are not interested in acquiring the building necessarily, then it may not be necessary to go forward with a month to month. You know, or we don't, we don't want, we don't need Suite A. Uh, that Suite A is just for office space, training space, operational space for uh, the Board of Elections. So. But, but the storage space we do need. Yeah, but it blocks it out. If we decide later on we made a mistake, and that's what we need. Well, I think the it would be a risk if you don't lease it. Someone else may want to lease it, or uh, you know, the property owner could always sell the entire property now. You know, they could mm -hmm. sell it any time if they got a willing buyer, of course. But um, so if yeah, I mean, it, it it could once it's out of our hands as a lease. I don't know what the demand is for uh, seven thousand square feet of former mm -hmm. pharmacy space. I don't know, but uh, if we don't continue to lease it, there is a chance that someone else would come along and lease it. Sure. You could also do a month to month with the idea that you could enter into a long term lease. Yes. And there's a lot of banking space on the market right now, there too. There is tons <laughs> of banking space. <laughs> Pam, we're all looking at you for that comment. I, I have no control and authority. I just, I, 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 just, I just can't get over how COVID money pays for an HVAC, kind of yeah. like water and sewer. What the heck, but whatever. So what's the board's pleasure? Do we have a motion? Well, can we negotiate mm -hmm. a month to month? That's what I want. The, the, uh, the B and C space 
lease expires in October 31. In October. Um, can we? But we don't need the A space at all right now. And I think that was one piece that I did not. Uh, I may not have covered. There, there's a month-to-month -month lease for Suite A. If you want to do that in the packet, yeah. Uh, it the new lease is 62, 14, 35. So it goes up, right? When we go to the month to month, it's going up, I believe, two percent. So the new cost for all suites, uh, suite A, B, and C, through October 31st, is ten thousand one hundred and four forty-six, as opposed to the ninety-nine hundred dollars. So if we if we go month to month, right? For suite A, it goes up a little bit. But that that's a possibility. We have it in the packet. I think the owner is prepared to sign a month to month lease with us uh, with either the idea of we're going to lease it for a longer term eventually or negotiate to purchase or walk away from it. We don't ever use Suite A because we're looking for some other solution for the Board of Elections storage. And I would suggest it's probably reasonable to be thinking long term of uh, relocating their operations from um, where it is now here on the corner. That's, that makes sense. I Having them near their stuff is a good idea. With the LME, the subcommittee worked really well. May I suggest to this board, we set up a subcommittee for this purpose with the Board of Elections. Mr. Lashley, I'd like for you to be on that subcommittee. We're going to have two commissioners because of the open meetings law. Um, we would have Kathy Holland, obviously. Certainly. Um, I think our building folks need to be on that committee. <laughs> yes. Uh, he's shaking his head. Yes, sir. <laughs> And Mr. Haygood and uh, Sherry Hook. Was there another commissioner you, you mentioned too? But Bill what? Lashley. Okay. And okay. Myself. Okay. And yourself. Not okay. Pam Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm so kind of for the board is still subject to the opening of this law. Just for the record. Certainly. What, what's he? What's he? What's he? No, the subcommittee no, of the full board is still subject to the opening of this law. Like Brian well, at Granddad's will Thomas, was for uh, sale. you're out of order, no, but we're not, we're not we're not talking about it's just that purpose. We're Sir? talking about us as a board having to mention every time we get on the telephone together. So, uh, but we're not going to violate knowingly the open meetings law. Thank you. Uh, okay, board, can we set up that subcommittee? Would you agree? Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. The, the commissioners, do you have any any guidance about uh, the month to month lease? Do we? Because this lease does expire uh, the uh, July thirty first, so we can let it expire, or we can. Uh, That's on sweet, sweet A. Which we're not using. Right. Sweet A. We we could we could renew it for another month as the subcommittee meets if the commissioners wanted to do that just to get some if you want to just keep a toe hold on the space mm -hmm. until you figure out there's something else you want to do that's certainly an idea too. Maybe that would be best, uh, lease it for at least another month. And if the committee meets, we would get the committee together before that uh, sure. next expiration and talk about what's the next move. That's one more month. Very reasonable. May turn into more if the subcommittee thinks that's the best solution or if there's more so solutions available, we may walk away from sweet A. So. Gotcha. Does that, does that sound reasonable to the commissioners? Extend uh, at least one more month? I highly suggest we don't yeah, rent does. a building that we're not using over one month. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does that does that need any kind of motion to, to renew the Probably lease? Needs that for, motion amended, doesn't it? I think the manager already has that authority up to fifty thousand dollars. Okay. So we don't need a motion then. Correct. Very well. We will renew for one month. And we will coordinate a committee uh, with the Board of Elections and Commissioner Lashley and Chair Pace. Thank you. Thank you. We have a uh, strong urging of some of the commissioners that we take a break. So <laughs> we're going to take a 10 minute break. We're back in session. Okay. The DSS uh, grant. Mm -hmm. Who's handling that? Well, Scott Sullivan, I believe, is available via Zoom and uh, will be addressing this item. Good evening, Commissioners. The Family Justice Center is requesting a budget amendment in the amount of $25,000. Family Justice Center was uh, awarded funding from Impact Alamance to add cameras to our existing security system. 
Uh, these cameras will be used to fill in some of our blind spots so that we can keep our victims safe and the, the staff and partners who work at the Family Justice Center. Uh, most of this funding will be used for the cameras, but any remaining funding will be used to enhance services by purchasing other equipment. The funding amount is a total of $25,000 and does not require a county match. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passed. Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think we have four public speakers. Um, Mr. Phil Bowers. Good morning. I'm a, good evening. It's almost <laughs> morning, but not quite. <laughs> uh, my name is Phil Bowers. Uh, I live at 3328 Ardmore Street in Burlington. Uh, my wife and I have been there for 24 years. We're not natives. We've been there 24 years. I'm also the founder and executive director of Sustainable Alamance. You've probably heard it said that you can give a man a fish and feed him for a day. You can teach a man to fish and feed him for life. Well, I suggest now that none of that matters if he doesn't have access to the lake. And that's what Sustainable Alamance is about. About 13 years ago, I was visiting a local ministry that a friend started for homeless um, men. Uh, and after a few visits, I heard men coming up and asking if they had any work to be done because they had to pay a probation fee. And I started asking about what that meant, and I learned that there were financial conditions and burdens when you have a criminal record. And a large majority of businesses at the time were not willing to hire men or women with a criminal history. Um, so you ask the question, how are they supposed to pay these fees and fines? So in 2008, I founded Sustainable Alamance to help men and women returning from incarceration to get their lives together, to get them connected to sustainable employment so they could legally take care of their financial obligations. We do this, we use best practices to do this. We do case management. We have on-site mental health evaluation and assistance. Uh, we have our own mini businesses, micro businesses, where we provide wages. Um, and we can evaluate a person's real desire for life change. But we also make it our purpose to look for things that might cause a problem in keeping a job. To date, we've helped over, well over 100 former offenders into full-time employment with a recidivism rate of a fraction over 10%. State, state and national average is 40 to 50, depending on how you calculate it. So rent is being paid, child support's being paid, taxes are being paid. Now we asked Elon University a few years ago to do an economic impact study of this, people not in prison and out being productive. And they concluded that our work had put over $5 million in positive economic impact into the county. And it was a return of over $11.75 for every dollar that was ever donated. So why am I here tonight was a couple of reasons. Uh, it's because we're growing. Earlier this year, we negotiated a long-term lease on property at Beverly Hills Church on North Church Street. Totals about 12,000 to 13,000 square feet. Um, the room's already configured into classrooms that we um, anticipate using this space for classrooms for GED, workforce development. Uh, with ACC, entrepreneurship classes with Elon, financial management, continued mental health services, uh, counseling, and whatever else we can identify that they would need to be successful. Access to the lake means adequately preparing them for work and then connecting them with employment. The reason, too, that I'm here is, once again, we're growing, and I want to be sure the county is aware of what we're doing and how we're doing it and the progress that we're making. Uh, I believe we have a proven program. We know what we're doing is working. I believe we have good relationships with the courts and law enforcement and growing relations with employers. So I want to be sure everybody in our community is aware of what we're doing. This is step one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Bowers. You. Thank you.
Okay, Kellyanne, and I apologize. Pronounce your last name, please, ma'am. She's not here. All right. She may not be here. Mm -hmm. Last name is spelled S K A H A M. Is she present? Do we you? have anybody know? Was she a call in? Or? No, she she uh, put her name on the list way before. Okay, good. All right. Next is David Vaughn. He spoke earlier. Yeah, he spoke earlier. All right. He's good. And we have uh, Teresa Wiley. Very good. <coughs> Greetings to the Alamance Board of Commissioners. My name is Teresa Wiley. I'm a resident here of Alamance County, residing on 423 Retreat Lane. Chairman Paisley and Vice Chair Carter, thank you for postponing the ARP discussion um, to August 2nd to allow for tonight's comment. Um, thank you, Commissioner Thompson, for your friendly greeting. It is very clear I realize that I'm not a familiar face in the room. As a community health center nurse, with a special uh, specialty in special populations, a previous behavioral health director, and a co-lead of the historically marginalized population with the state out of the Office of Minority Health, I stand before you to speak on behalf of many who are not here tonight. This is in regards to the utilization of the ARP funds. I advocate that a diverse task force be created to include community stakeholders, community members, and especially faith leaders to drive the allocations of the American Rescue Dollars for Alamance County residents. This task force should be mandated to use data-driven approaches to ensure health equity and financial sustainability is a priority, accessible, and equitable to the, cities, to the citizens here in Alamance County. There are many, many lessons that have been learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Those lessons will teach us and have taught us how we can improve and sustain the efforts made in public health, small business sustainability, health equity, adolescent mental health and substance use, the impact of the digital divide here in Alamance County, and also to address racial justice, to just name a few. After hearing it via health presentation, I also recommend that the funds be used to survey the community of the pros and cons of how their mental health treatment and access was available during the pandemic. In Mr. Turner's words, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Thank you. Can we thank, thank you. you as well? Okay. Um, any commissioner responses? Ms. Taygood, I'm you're back up. Glad you're here, and I hope you come again. Thank you for your <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Haygood, Commissioner's report. Um, I would like to take just a moment, Commissioners, to um, say thank you to the Health Department. I know we have Tony here. I think they did an outstanding job on their reaction with the City of Burlington's uh, water issue. The Health Department was uh, engaged immediately and contacted hundreds of uh, uh, businesses across the, not just City of Burlington, but all the areas served by Burlington Water, and numerous county departments sent staff to help, uh, to help, help out. I know parks, maintenance, uh, I, I can't even remember everybody. I don't know if there was uh, other folks that came to. There were a number of departments that sent uh, Sheriff and That's right, Sheriff and Landfill, yes. So just uh, as always, spur of the moment, real quick reaction group, help. And uh, you know, we were putting out calls to try to get employees to augment their group, and uh, county departments responded very well, so we appreciate that. Um, the other piece I want to touch on this evening, I'm going to give you a memo that I received from Susanna Goldman. Susanna is the director of our library system. I know we've had numerous questions, concerns from citizenry about the new um, uh, fines, the new no fines at the library and how that might impact and how that works for our library system. I asked, thank you, uh, I asked Susanna, to, and she's here to the same thing Susanna is, I asked Susanna to provide us with uh, just some information uh, that we can talk about just briefly here so everybody watching can kind of get a better idea of how this program works. As you can see, uh, when folks check out a material from the library, they have 21 days to, to enjoy it. If nobody's on the list to get that item, they can renew it twice. Uh, but if the item's not returned, you can see in this memo what starts happening. At 14 days past due, the patron gets a overdue notice uh, through the mail or through, the, through email. 
and this is under our new system, this is the current system, no fines, but this is what happens. At 22 days, the, the user's privileges are blocked, right? So if once the item is 22 days overdue, uh, they cannot come and check out any other materials. Uh, at 28 days past due, the library sends a second notice uh, to the patron, and then at 49 days, the item is marked lost, and the uh, information is turned over to a collection agency. The person cannot check out additional material or use any of our uh, resources at the library. So it's a we want to make sure the public understands this isn't anything that uh, uh, encourages people to take our materials and not bring them back. I think the library feels, uh, and I don't want to, Susanna can say this better than I can, but I think the library feels that removing the fines is encouraging people to bring the materials back, which is what the library really wants. But there is still mechanisms in place to ensure that people bring the materials back, and if they do not, they are cut off, uh, and are, there is a final uh, act to try to get the, the material back. So Suzanne, I don't know if you want anything to add to that or? You uh, stated that very well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we've asked the library to track the number of losses that they're experiencing now under the new policy compared to last year, how many uh, materials that they have lost, just to see is this contributing to people not bringing their material back. Although I do say, you know, the folks that come and check out books or use these materials are usually regular library users, so they don't want to lose these privileges. That's a pretty big deterrent for most library users. So, um, I think the library is excited about it. I think this is the trend that the library system is seeing around the, around the state. So. Yes, more and more libraries in our state are going fine-free. So fine-free. We have joined that trend a little bit sooner than a lot of uh, rural, rural counties tend to do it. So. Yay, I appreciate that very much. And it's, it's a benefit for our community and our citizens to not have a punitive action just for being a day or two late. And my grandchildren checked out books today. Yeah. So. Did you get his address? I said grandchildren, don't send Terry to mom. <laughs> well, okay. that, that, that's all that I have. Uh, can I ask a quick question about the library? What so, COVID and this may be better for Susanna. What uh, COVID restrictions are still being implemented at the libraries? We still have uh, like the spit guards, the barriers between staff and, and the public, and we encourage the use of masks for people who aren't vaccinated. Um, and some chairs have still been removed that are so there's not like six people at a table, but that's essentially it. Okay. I think the libraries are back to pre-COVID pre -COVID operational hours also, so they're back open as they were before the COVID pandemic. So. Just as a quick uh, note, it may be good if we're comparing data, uh, new plan versus old plan, to go back a little further than the COVID year. I mean, COVID is such an outlier. That's, that's true. true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Just to get some comparative data. Uh, excellent point. I think, in fact, through COVID, I think that we were, we were closed a great deal. So, uh, yes. We do have that capability to go back probably 10 years. Um, it might be good too to know what the statistical data would be on collections once you actually turn it over to a collection agency. Are they buying those and then going out and collecting them? Or I know there are some agencies that will actually buy the debt. No, no. Discounted. They handle the communication of that, and it, it's not anything that gets reported to like a their credit, credit bureau or anything like that. It's right. they take over the communication. They do like change of address verifications, and then you know if necessary, they'll call and try to reach out in order to collect the money for us, but the payments actually come to the library. Um, they do not pay the collection agency, they pay, people pay the library for their fines, and then we communicate to the collection agency that it's been paid. So how much are we paying them to do the collections? It is per customer payments. And I can tell you the off the top of my head, so it depends on how many items get sent as to the, the cost. <coughs> Tony, I also would like to say thank you. Well handled, you noticed everyone. Just want to say thanks. May I ask one other question? Um, you and I personally and uh, have talked about a grant writer. Um, is that a possibility? Is it a good idea? And will it make us money to have a uh, on staff grant writer? Uh, I think that's something that uh, we had planned on discussing on the second, uh, particularly as we get into the ARC funds. You know, the county is getting $32 million in ARC funding, but there are 
uh, millions of dollars that are being put into various federal pots under different uh, departments of the federal government, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Justice. So something the board may want to consider is if we were to offer assistance to uh, other smaller cities in our county, volunteer fire departments, it, uh, any kind of governmental agency that may not have the capacity to go out, may not be getting any ARP funds or have the capacity staff-wise to do that. You may be, uh, if you want to think about the possibility of using some ARP funds to, to retain someone to do that work. And I mean, if you wanted to extend that to other grants, that's certainly a thought. I think there'll be so much federal money in these ARP pots that are not going to local governments that that would probably be the primary group to, to hit. We will be bringing, um, as, the, as the commissioners have mentioned, August 2nd, we'll be bringing an overview of the ARP program. The, uh, the PowerPoint that's been put together is excellent. It is lengthy. We will not go through it slide by slide. We will send it to you before the agenda packet so you can read it. But I think it will serve as an excellent resource for the committee because it is a very distilled version of the guidance as we know it now. You know, we're going to be getting, uh, uh, you know, some. I think once we start getting our reporting forms uh, later in the fall, we'll have even more idea of how we can spend this money. But you're going to get a good overview that we will go through quickly, but we'll give it to you early. You'll also get uh, a list of some immediate spending considerations that the board could consider uh, using the ARP funds before the committee is structured. You could, uh, we have some uh, things that you could spend money on immediately. I think there's been some discussion about some of these among commissioners. And then there are some things you could earmark money for because the committee is going to be, you know, how you're going to work through to figure out how to best spend these funds. If you see any of these items on these, this list that we will give you, and you'll get that before the meeting and plenty of time for you to be able to digest it and think about it. But uh, that's kind of our hope going into the second. Give you the overview. A, a good distilled version of guidance that you can use as you meet with the committee and then some ideas about things you may want to earmark ARP dollars for right away uh, and, and, and say these are not necessarily need the uh, committee's view it is not anywhere near 32 million dollars I will tell you that the vast majority of this money is going to be committee discussed but there are some things that you may want to consider and we will share that with you yeah we'll get that in two segments too about 16 and a half each that's correct. We've received the first tranche uh, already. Um, Susan has it invested, and we'll be receiving the other tranche. Uh, it was, I believe, the legislation was with one year, within one year of receiving the first, uh, the first allotments. How do you invest that? You doing short-term notes? Uh, right now, it's invested at the Capital Management Trust. Okay. Who is this committee? So we're going to talk about that too. That's the second item to discuss on August 2nd. We'll give you an overview, some recommendations to think about spending, and then uh, we have some suggestions for the commissioners for how to structure the, the committee. We've had people reach out to us already. We've had uh, some organizations from the community reach out to us that want to have a seat at the committee, but uh, the commissioners will need to determine is that all five commissioners or is that a, a smaller contingent of commissioners? Do you want representatives from some community organizations to be with you? We've talked about uh, doing at large where the commissioners would be able to appoint specific people that you know that you think uh, are uh, just general public that you want to be on the committee to. This sounds like we are complicating it. Sounds almost kind of like Washington, D.C. Let's get 9,000 people on a committee that can't agree about nothing. I just just let's just please not make this complicated everybody in this county knows what they need and they just need a voice and I don't want the populars who, who am I to say that I can't say it <coughs> I don't want the populars that are on everything doing this because I want the people that if I'm working with Bill and he's a hot mess and I'm his case manager I think you need to hear from me about this money for my organization um, <laughs> I just don't want to see us complicate this and get this so sterile and so business. This We got so many things in this county that need our help with our citizens, our taxpayers, our citizens, us, our families. And um, we, we can't blow this because we, we're going to do it the way we've always done everything. You know, it's like... We just, we just can't do that. We got to do this so right, and it's got to really serve the people that have took the biggest hits while COVID was going on. And um, 
And there are a lot of people that took those hits and we got to make sure that we do something for them and uh, so they can get back on their feet and start serving the very people that we need them to, just like Mr. Mental Health was talking. Holy cow, holy cow. I'm not saying that you are a hot mess. Hey, it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's not a requirement to have a committee. I think uh, I applaud the commissioners for giving that consideration. So it, it will be however the commissioners determine it's best structured, how many people, what groups are represented. Uh, it's not a, a, a requirement to do. I think there's wisdom in doing that, and you may wind up uh, having some subcommittee groups because there's uh, a significant amount of interest in things like broadband infrastructure here. So, you know, you may not want to have this committee, whatever the committee turns out to be, to be the ones talking about that. There's already some groups that are talking about that. There's digital inclusion groups, good examples. Um, well, in the state of North Carolina is looking at pushing to put $700 million into broadband in North Carolina. Let them. That's correct. That's what I'm saying. Yes. I mean, we can use some of it for that maybe, but there's a whole pile more money coming in here for coming around the state for that too. So I just think about the word committee means meeting and setting a date to have another meeting it's, and having another meeting. And I don't want to be 83 years old by the time we spend this money. I just want this money to go to the right people who have served this county at the worst time of our history. So yes. not, not history, but just in a while. Ms. Haygood, anything else? No, sir. All right. We are needing to go into a closed session. Mr. Chairman, real quick, uh, is there going to be time for commissioner comments now? It's oh, on the agenda yes, sir. Let's, session. let's do that right now. Uh, Thank you. I know the hour is late. I, there's something on my mind I really wanted to talk about. Um, the, and I'll be brief. The, we obviously have a statutory duty to fund capital improvements for APSS. Um, we began in March having pretty in-depth discussions about capital improvements when we were uh, issuing bond monies. We were told in March that there was $50 million of unfunded capital improvements for ABSS. I asked at that time, let's have a list, a prioritized list and a schedule for when certain requirements would, would, be, would, would be needed. Um, that was in March. The, we, we were told at budget time that there was $73.6 million in unfunded capital improvements right. for ABSS. Again, I said, let's get a prioritized list. Um, I know the technical improvement, uh, the, te the um, technical review committee and the oversight committee is a, a process that's been outlined for us to get priorities from ABSS and, and ACC, but particularly ABSS, uh, to, to have a, a list that we know that we need to work from. That hasn't happened. It's, it's almost August. I, I don't think it's too much to ask for the following. By the end of July, when we go through this round, the July's round of technical review and operational uh, review committees, that we have a top 10 list. What is ABSS, ABSS's top 10 list of most important capital improvements that need to be made, prioritized with a schedule and when it needs to happen? Now, it, it may be too much to ask in a week to have the entire $74 million prioritized, but I don't think a top 10 list is too much. And I think our board ought to say to the board, the Board of Education, or the, the ABSS School Board, direct your folks to provide the county commissioners through the technical review and operational review committees to have a top 10 list by the end of July. I, agree. I have also asked for a list from ABSS numerous times, uh, and I have not received anything as well. So, um, I think we've been patient, but, but Absolutely. my patience is, is running thin. And I, 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 I fully feel your pain because that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about tonight as well, is that the school system, they, our taxpayers are responsible for maintenance and operations of the school system. I have see a lot of operation words in, in the school system's words, but I don't see a maintenance plan. I, the taxpayers want a maintenance plan because we are required to fund it. How do we do that? I think ABSS needs to get on the stick and get us the stuff that we ask for. And I don't want to like make this a political kind of thing, but uh, you know, we, I, I actually look for them to actually help us here because we, we, did, we did them a favor tonight. Yep. Okay, start earning your money. Let's get going. Let's get a maintenance plan for the school system. 
because that's what the taxpayers require. It's easy, and I'll be more than happy to work with them. But now that we've got this budget done, Ju July 1st is our first budget, the school systems, we're going to be in close contact over the next 11 months. Now, I think they can do it. It's just a matter of doing it. I think they have the capability of making it happen. I'm glad you brought it up, Mr. Turner. I think it's a good, and good so idea. so let, let me recommend this. All four of you guys, and I'll put my list together as well, as to what we're asking from the Alamance Burlington School System. Uh, send it to me in a written format mm -hmm. within the next week or so. Yeah, let's, get, um, let's get busy on it. And then we'll put together a letter that either I can sign as chair or we can all sign, mm -hmm. depending on how you want to put it together. But let's put something in writing and I'll hand deliver it, I'll mail it, I'll do whatever's necessary. But I totally, totally agree. Mr. Carter? Well, I was just thinking, uh, uh, it seems like I recall Dr. Thorpe having a list in his hand that, where he got his 70, I think it was $77 million. Mm -hmm. the unfunded right. 73 unfunded, unfunded needs. Mm -hmm. And he had a list in his hand. I just don't know why they haven't provided it to us. Well, you know, you think uh, the way the way it's explained to me, and I'm not a maintenance guy, but if if you were going to have a maintenance plan for 2021, 2022, wouldn't you know what's on first on the list? The first thing that we're going to go maybe be taken out and say, hey, look at this project that we finished. That's right. I think that the school system has does a very bad job at telling a story, and and I want to help them, and I think we can, and I certainly know that I definitely want to make sure that we get a maintenance plan. It, that's what the taxpayers require. And Dr. Benson and Allison Gann as chair and Brian Haygood and myself met, what, roughly 30 <coughs> days ago and asked a lot of questions and, and, and so forth. Uh, and they've indicated they would like to start doing that, you know, having that conversation. Obviously, we have two of you guys uh, attending their board meetings, what, twice a month? Yeah. Uh, and so forth. Times so we're having more and more contact with the school board. Um, I just want hard answers. Yeah, so do I. I've already started, you know, to uh, start asking those questions. Now, Mr. Albright, my understanding is that. that we as county commissioners under the North Carolina General Statutes have the rights, the right, the statutory right to look at their records. Is that correct? That's correct. They're public records. So we can gather information. I'd rather do it on a friendly basis instead of a demand basis. You know, I'd like to work with these guys, um, but I think they need to understand that we have the right to see all these records. And it's been three months. Like Mr. Turner asked, I think you've asked questions. I mean, it's, it, time's up. You've had enough time. Now it's time to make it happen. Everybody send me your list. Gotcha. Last week would be fine. <laughs> Last week? Okay. You've already got it in your email. Okay. <laughs> Before we go into closed session, anything else, commissioners? All right. We need to go into cl closed session. Um, and I move that we now go into closed session for certain North Carolina General Statute um, 143-318.11. Print A1 and 143.318.11 A6 to prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential and to consult with our county attorney. Additionally, I move that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute section 143-318.11 A6 to consider the performance of a uh, present employee. Do I have a second? Second. Second. I have two seconds? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Madam Mr. Board Chairman, would you consider an amendment to your motion to add a discussion about a litigation matter? Yes. Uh, to add a discussion about uh, 21 CVS, I believe, uh, 753 Pollen versus City of Graham et al. And I'll add that to my motion. Do you add that to your second? Certainly. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Whatever. We're in closed session. <laughs> okay, we're back in session.
um, re reviewed confidential and privileged information and gave instructions to our county attorney. Mr. Albright, is there anything else that we need to say? Not about that, no. no. And that's all we did. But it, the, uh, that's that's all we did. That's all we did. And as, as for the personnel matter, if you made a decision we, did, we that, did We didn't take any action. All right. So, do we have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> all in favor, Are say aye. 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 His Thomas was saying. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.